Support for Boston Public Radio comes from Aware Recovery Care, committed to pioneering an in-home, pandemic-safe drug and alcohol addiction treatment program in Massachusetts. Now you can recover at home. AwareRecoveryCare.com. Head on Boston Public Radio, are we finally going to begin fixing our sagging roads and bridges and lead water pipes? NBC political director Chuck Todd will join us with the latest on the infrastructure bill, the January 6th Capitol attack hearings, and a rowdy showdown in the House over mask mandates. I'm Jared Bowen, and for Jim Browdy, President Biden has picked Suffolk DA Rachel Rollins to be U.S. Attorney for Massachusetts. The progressive prosecutor ran for district attorney on a platform of not prosecuting low-level offenses and often found herself at odds with the law enforcement establishment. So what would she bring to the U.S. Attorney role if she's approved by the Senate? Andrea Cabral will discuss ahead on Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy is out. Jared Bowen, executive arts editor at GBH, is in. Hello again, Jared. Hi, Marjorie. Great to be with you again. Great to be with you as well. And joining us on the line, also great to be with him to talk all things, all things politics, is Chuck Todd. <clears throat> He's the moderator of Meet the Press, which you can catch Sunday mornings at 1030 on NBC Boston, Channel 10 on most providers. He's also the host of Meet the Press Daily on MSNBC and the political director for NBC News. Hey, Chuck. Well, hello there. Uh, I've missed you guys. Oh, well, thank you. I hope you had a nice vacation. We had lots of people complaining that you weren't here. I said, the poor guy, you know, <laughs> he wants to take a few days off and go on vacation. Well, you know, we, I have to make room for Katie Ledecky and, and, and uh, you know, all of our right. Olympian uh, friends that we're all excited about. And Sunisi here. I know I don't want to give away the store, but I think we've all seen our alert. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's um, um you know, uh, it's, it's the Olympics. It's the Olympics, and the Americans are we doing. Did. I mean, we had this Simone Biles thing. I know lots of people were disappointed because they were so rooting for her, but we've. I think the Americans have done pretty well, don't you think? I think so. I yeah, mean, you know, I sort of expected us to, since we were the most vaccinated country going into the thing. I mean, you know, that was one of the other advantages we had. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. We're going to talk a little bit about vaccines, or at least about masks in a couple of minutes. But I want to start with this uh, uh, infrastructure bill. As people probably know, the uh, in 60, 67 to 32 vote, uh, Democrats, 67, Republicans, 32, but it's pretty good in terms of bipartisanship. Uh, lawmakers in the Senate voted to begin debating this infrastructure reform. So this does seem like it's a very, for those of us who are worried about the sagging roads and bridges and lead pipes, and broadband, et cetera. This, this does seem to be hopeful, I think. Okay, it is. And this is, you know, there's, there's, there's some old axioms in Washington that still sort of, um, that they'll still sort of matter. And this is going to sound very simplistic what I'm about to say, but, but you'll understand why I say it this way, which is if everybody wants a deal, deals can get done in Washington. And here was a case where Biden was not going to let this deal die. And there were enough Senate Republicans who won some roads and bridges like, you know, Rob Portman from Cincinnati, one of the most dilapidated bridges, but most important bridges in America is to connect Cincinnati to northern Kentucky. Who's the senator from Kentucky that voted for this infrastructure package yesterday? Oh, right. Mitch McConnell. You know, so <laughs> the point is, is that you had a case where everybody wanted to get to yes. Right. And if you want to get to yes in Washington, you can get to yes. That's just the bottom line. Right. And I know that seems like a well, you know, there was. If you wanted to derail this, you could have. Mitch McConnell chose not to. That tells you a lot. Joe Biden wouldn't let progress. He could have walked away a bunch of times. There were plenty of ways he could have rationalized doing it, right? But he didn't either, right? So it's a big deal. It is, it is a vision. This is, you know, for, for Biden, this is a proof of concept. He ran promising that he could bring back some of this to Washington again. So he is extraordinarily incentivized to try to get this deal across the finish line. Um, so, look, I, I think it's a big deal in proving that, you know, Biden in the first year of his president, I mean, put it this way, 
he better be able to get this done in the first year of a presidency. This is the easiest time where you have leverage as a president, right? Every year you're in office, longer you're in office as a president, you you start to lose leverage, right? So, you know, this is the time he has maximum leverage to get everybody. But think about this aspect. This deal was done. We, we focus a lot of our time and energy on, on, the, on the progressive left and the Trump Republicans. Right. This bill was passed by people that are not members of either group. It's an important, it's an important thing for us to consider. Yeah, and to that end, what are the signs that we pay attention to going forward? Because a bill, I'm, I'm not trying to be the pessimist here because I, I like everybody yeah. else, wants to hope that this is going to go through. But it's not written yet. There's no final tally yet. But – it's moving ahead. So with the collaboration, a word we hardly ever use in politics anymore that we see happening, what do we pay attention to how this comes together? Well, I think a, a lot of the focus now becomes, you know, the, the group of, of, of lawmakers that could kill this, I think, is more likely now on the left than it is on the right. Right. It, it is. And so it really is about um, how much room does Pelosi in the House feel like she has? Remember, her majorities are tight. Um, a, a group of, of, of progressives could, could hold everything up. And I think how this reconciliation bill comes together, right? You already have, you know, Kirsten Sinema saying, look, I'm going to vote to start the process, but I don't, I'm not necessarily going to support um, that big number yet, that 3.5 trillion. So how much lower can the number go to keep both Kirsten Cinema and Bernie Sanders on board. I, I wouldn't say AOC. It's possible that, you know, some of these on the progressive left won't ever be on board on this. Um, but I go back to something I said at the beginning. A president has maximum leverage in their first year in office. Will the progressive left really sink Biden in yeah. his first year? Right. You know, so, you know, I just don't picture that. But I, if you're asking me, what do we focus on to see – where this is going. It's on the detail of how this reconciliation Democrats only bill comes together because if progressives can get 70% of what they want there, then it means the bipartisan deal I think is going to go through sort of as, as it's been, as it's been outlined. Is Biden, you know, I, <clears throat> he gave a speech, I think it was in, in Philadelphia, somewhere in Pennsylvania yesterday, kind of selling his program. We talked a lot about how Obama, how Obama really didn't do a great job selling Obamacare. A lot of people had no idea what it even was in, about. Uh, is he going to sell this hard? Because you do think this is, as we know, it's very popular with, with American people. Lots of people would like to have broadband. Lots of people would like to have, especially those people in Cincinnati, you mentioned a bridge. <clears throat> They're not worried about uh, collapsing. So how much is that going to matter, especially for the House, too? I think, it, I think it's going to matter a lot. I think Biden is going to sell this thing because I think that they're going to be of the and, and the you know, it wasn't an accident that he's in Pennsylvania um, to do it. I think you're going to see him particularly in the in the five or six closest states, your Arizona's, your Georgia's, your Pennsylvania's, Michigan's and Wisconsin's. I think he's going to spend a lot of time selling it there. I think if he doesn't, it's a mistake. Um, you know, but it, it seems inevitable he's going to go to those states in particular because, oh, by the way, uh, I believe five, of those five states I mentioned, four of the five have competitive Senate races that we're all going to be focused on that will decide the majority in 2022. I think Michigan's the only outlier there uh, of those five. So uh, I do expect that. I think it would be a massive mistake if he doesn't. But this is who Biden is. I think the, here's the other thing. I think he's going to enjoy selling the infrastructure plan. Right. This is this is who he is. Hey, you go to Washington and you go out and you and, and you tell people what you've done for them. Right. I got you this bridge. I got you this thing. This is I think Biden just in his heart believes this is what you do. So I fully expect it. And I expect it to be more so than we see. You know, I, I think the last time we had a, a president that really liked to hit the road to sell stuff was W. W did it. and Clinton did it. They were both. And I think you're going to see Biden be more like Clinton and W on this stuff than, than Obama and Trump, right? Both of Obama didn't like selling it for his own. He, you know, I think he felt as if it's obvious, you know, I don't, you know, yeah. and yeah. then I think, you know, Trump, Trump had his own ways. He, you know, he never sold, he never campaigned on his tax cut. You'd think, you know, now maybe he realized it wasn't as popular as people thought, but he didn't know how to stump or sell anything. He knows how to, 
he knows how to sell against stuff. He never has, knows how to promote stuff that is positive. So I, I, I imagine Biden is going to look, this is going to look a lot more like a, like a, a barnstorming uh, campaign that we saw from W back when he was selling his tax cut or, or Clinton when he would, would go around the country selling his, his plants. Well, Chuck, speaking of the House, or, or do we call it a preschool now, based on <laughs> what we've seen over the last 24 hours, a Capitol Hill physician decides that masks should be worn in the Capitol again because of the spread of the Delta variant, uh, you know, something buildings all across the country, counties all across the country are, are facing yet again uh, in the Capitol. He thinks it's, it, well, they think it should be the case because of the high influx of travelers from all over the country. But we see the GOP responding, some instances some people accusing them of uh, or, or, or mentioning that they're dropping the masks or throwing the masks on the ground instead of wearing them. Yeah, I, you know, it, I'm of two minds in this. I, I look, I just think this looks absurd to the American public, right, in general. And so now I do think there is mask fatigue. And I think, you know, telling people, and I get that part of it. But, you know, there's a lot of this feels like people are performing for their social media groups, right? Yeah. Whether, whether they want to be the, Right. Whether they want to be the anti-maskers or they want to be the mask police. Right. You know, there's people that enjoy being the mask police. You're not wearing a mask. Right. Um, I, I think there's exhaustion from sort of from and, and I'm, apologies for the both siderisms on this one. But I think there's a little bit of exhaustion. I think it's I think it's sort of like, look, here's your best practices. If you choose not to do it, you're seeing what's going on in the, in the death rates here. Um, and, and so. I, I do think the better posture is, unfortunately, we have to go back to this. But I kind of think the way they message this should be that. This is the last thing we want to be doing. Yeah. And I think that that's where the Biden administration, I think, has sort of gotten, you know, I think the messaging here needs to be, trust me, the last thing we wanted to do was make this recommendation of putting masks in school. But guess what? We have no choice. Here are the facts. You know, and the unvaccinated, and more importantly, People, this Delta variant, vaccinated people were a, apparently we, we could be asymptomatic spreaders, right? And the same problem, right? The asymptomatic, it turned out what made this virus so vicious? There were people that spreading it who didn't even know they had it, right? Yeah. Well, it looks like vaccinated people be, are, a, are we're, we're now potentially at risk of being the super spreaders without even knowing it. And so I think that we've done a, when I say collectively, I think the government's in a poor job of explaining why we're here. And I think that would be the, I, I would, and I think their tone needs to be, we didn't want to be here either. But unfortunately we, you know, we're trying to give you the best information to save your life. You don't like it. That's your business. Now let's move on to vaccine, vaccine mandate. I do think it's interesting. There are two things we do now know the biggest, if you've seen now, we've seen some evidence of this. Apparently, the single biggest motivator to get a vaccine is finding out all your friends and neighbors are dying from the virus. Yeah. Because we are now seeing, you know, it's what happened in South Texas. When did South Texas finally get their vaccination rate up after more people were dying in the area? Right. It, 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 unfortunately, that seems to be the best motivator we have is um, when there's a spike of deaths among unvaccinated in a specific geographic area. People wake up and think, all right, maybe I'll get this vaccine. Well, Mitch McConnell, at least, he's, he's, he's been heavy on this. I think he's even doing an ad about getting, getting a vaccine. And Mitch McConnell, people may know, was a, a polio survivor. So uh, I'm sure he thinks a lot about that in this context. So that's, that's a good thing. I don't know if it was helpful for I, Nancy Pelosi. I will tell you to this. I think, what? I'll tell you, Mar I, the flip here among Republicans has been remarkable over the yeah. last three weeks. Yeah. And I think that this... This really has. I mean, I don't know if you saw John Kennedy, the senator from no. Louisiana. Who, no, what he know, do? thing is killing people. He was just like he was asked about the mask mandate. He goes, look, I don't want to get he, he was trying to he tried to sidestep the mask conversation. And he just went to this thing is killing people. Please go get vaccinated. I mean, it was yeah. sort of this, you know, I, it, it's like a Roy Blunt did an event yesterday. He says, let me tell you the story of three people here in Missouri. You know, talked about somebody who wished they had gotten a vaccine on their deathbed, things like oh. that. Um, it, it, it is interesting to me that, that the memo went out somewhere in Republican circles that, Hey, your constituents are dying. You need to do something. Yeah. About this. 
we're, we're talking to Chuck Todd from Meet the Press. Chuck, I did want to um, uh, ask you about your reaction to the hearings of the, the beginnings of these uh, hearings on the on the January sixth attack on the Capitol. The four police officers with a riveting testimony, and then them getting trashed along partisan uh, partisan lines. Where where are we going to go from from here? Look, I think this uh, com- I think this committee had a lot on day one to me, came across with a lot more credibility. I mean, take away the partisan sniping uh, on, the, on the right about it. Um, in the sort of normal world, I think nobody is going to think that Liz Cheney and Anna, uh, is somehow some Pelosi liberal here, no, right? And no. I think that for the, for the average middle-of-the-road middle the voter who doesn't, who, who pays, you know, who sort of, who isn't, you know, watching cable news obsessively at night or, you know, or, or, or you know, sucked into political conversations all the time. I think they're going to look at that and say, oh, that's a sober-minded individual. That's a, you know, I think the select committee presented them. It felt a lot more like the 9-11 committee to me or X study group where you, it wasn't about the committee members. It was about the people testifying. Um, look, I think Republicans have a ton to fear on this. I think Mo Brooks getting subpoenaed is going to be the next big, I mean, forget Trump and, and Kevin McCarthy. You know, I think the first electric moment is going to be this is when Mo Brooks, because I think he'll be the easiest first person to get in front of the committee. Uh, you know, as a, as a, you know, now that he's publicly said he wore body armor, well, clearly yeah. he knew something was up on January 6th, right? I mean, he just made himself to me a material witness immediately. You know, we know McCarthy's going to get, you know, that will be a, a, a bigger, longer, drawn out fight. But I, look, I think this thing is, is, it, it started off in cr- very credible. Um, I think that this is a very sober-minded group. I think there's really only one sort of real partisan bomb thrower in the, um, among that group. And I think that's, and I, again, to tr- basically the Democrats deciding to treat Liz Cheney as the ranking member is brilliant. Um, and adding Kinzinger has really, to me, made it where all – all that's missing is a Trump loyalist, and who thinks we should have a Trump loyalist when you're investigating this insurrection that was inspired by Trump? Right? Rational people aren't going to think that that's a good idea. Yeah, Mo Brooks, we should just remind people, is the Alabama congressman who was talking about uh, kicking ass. Can I say that? I already did <laughs> prior to the president <laughs> addressing the crowd uh, on back in uh, back on the January 6th rally before they headed down um, toward the Capitol. It, it, what happens if Trump gets subpoenaed? Is that going to happen? It's a great question. I, I, I don't know. Um, but he's a private citizen. I don't know how he would duck a subpoena. Like, I don't yeah. think there's no. He, he, here's the interesting thing about executive privilege. The person, the, the person who's in charge of invoking it is the sitting president, not a former president. Former presidents don't have any executive privilege power unless the current president uh, 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 agrees to it. And in fact, that has happened in the past. I believe Obama allowed some executive privilege invocations for Bush officials. I think Bush did it for Clinton officials. Like, it's not unprecedented for sitting presidents to do that for previous administrations, because a lot of times it's do unto others as you want to be done unto. Right. But in this case, does anybody think Biden is going to sort of help Trump invoke an executive privilege argument? Um, I don't think so. So I, not only do I think it, I think there might be some um, attempts to try to slow down when something like this would happen or try not to do it on camera, things like that. But I don't know how he ducks it. But I wouldn't do Trump first. You know, you want to do Mo Brooks. I yeah. think you want to do, um, you know, you have you have cause there. It's Kevin McCarthy. You have cause there. You know, any any member of Congress who's sort of been involved. Tommy Tupperville, I think we're going to see him, right? He was the one that got some phone calls. Mike Lee seemed to get a phone call from Rudy Giuliani. So maybe Rudy Giuliani gets subpoenaed too. I think there's a lot of people you go to first that, you know, again, as Liz Cheney said, we want to know what was happening every second, every minute of the day on that day in that White House. Hey, Chuck, we're out of time, but thank you so much for that analysis. I loved every single minute you to mentioned. You. <laughs> Great to talk to you, too. Talk next time. We missed you when you're on vacation. So do the listeners. See ya. Wow.
Great to have you back. Chuck Todd joins us every week. He's the moderator of Meet the Press, which you can catch Sunday mornings at 1030 on NBC Boston. That's Channel 10 on most providers. He's also the host of the Meet the Press Daily on MSNBC and the political director for NBC News. Well, coming up, we're going back to masks, talking about it anyway. In the mask confusion, we're opening up the lines and asking you about the new CDC mask guidelines. Keep your dial on 89.7 GBH, Boston Public Radio. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jack Bowen is in for Jim Browdy. So in May, the CDC lifted mass restrictions for the fully vaccinated. Now the CDC is advising the fully vaccinated and everybody else to mask up in areas where cases are still high. While easing mask guidelines was intended to be an incentive for people to get a vaccine today with the return of mask mandates, does it feel like the fully vaccinated are the ones who are being penalized? We're taking your calls asking what do the new mask guidelines mean to you? 877-301-8970, 877-301-8970. The email is bpr at wgbh.org, and you can tweet us at Boss Public Radio. So you were, are you confused about where you need to mask up? Do you run a business that's now in the tough position of asking people to mask up again? If the initial end of mask mandates felt like we were getting on the other side of the pandemic psychologically, How's the return of mask wearing affecting you and making you feel? Again, 877-301-8970. Are you going out of your way to avoid places where masks are now required? Do you even know where your masks are? <laughs> Did you decide to con Mari your mask when the restrictions were lifted as a Marie Kondo and throw them out and get rid of them, thank them for their service, and put them in the trash? 877-301-8970. All about masks. Uh, for the, uh, from now until the the top of the hour. Have you got your mask ready to go now, Jared? You got them all out of the mothballs or what? There you go. <laughs> I'm holding it right up because there is a big production that's happening at GBH today, and I just, with so many people in the building, it just feels like the right, responsible thing to do. Can I just say, so Marjorie, I'm normally a chipper person, right? I try to be upbeat. Yeah. And have, I, you, try, so, you do. You're very upbeat. Except for you don't whine like Jim does every <laughs> single day. But right now I'm going to, I am so irritated, Marjorie, I can't even tell you. I am so angry that we're back in this position. Last night I went to The Tempest on Boston Common. The first, oh, great. Right. The first live theater that I have attended since the before times. So, you know, nearly a year and a half. It was so wonderful to be out in the open, to feel it safe, to be back seeing live theater, which I hadn't seen for a year and a half practically. You could feel the energy. They were so excited at Commonwealth Shakespeare Company to be back on the stage. We are about to see theaters reopening here beginning at the end of August, yes. starting with the Huntington yes. and then successive theaters going back to live in-person performances. God help me if that gets jeopardized because we are seeing people being so irresponsible that they can shut down the arts community again, not to mention restaurants and other businesses. We, this is just so outrageous at this point. Yeah, well, I, th- I think the thing is now that um, uh, it, it, the real issue is unvaccinated people who aren't getting vaccinated and some of them who don't wear masks. And now the latest news that you find out that if you are vaccinated, you could be spreading the virus because of the viral lower of this, of this variant. And it's, it's really, it's, it's really upsetting. I think it might've been better if we didn't get rid of the masks two months ago, because now we were all running around like everything was swell. And now we're finding out it's not so swell. Well, it's because partly because we had faith in humanity, didn't we? We thought the, the vaccines are coming. We were doing the right thing. I know it wasn't necessarily trending well to know that half of the country wasn't going to be vaccinated, but you know, who was who to think that that was such a bad idea to go back to freedom to not have the masks, which, again, is such a simple thing. I have no problem wearing the masks. Absolutely no problem. You're right. I'm kind of shifting the talk, this talk segment on you uh, to, to the vaccinated, but I, I do believe they are intertwined. Michael in Cambridge, what do you think? So, actually, you, you said exactly what I believe. I, um, I get, vac- I get uh, tested every week. And I have wow. friends who think I'm too upset. I do because, well, I, I feel that, that, you know, I can still give the virus to somebody. And mm-hmm. I want to know if I have it because I'm one of these people that I don't wear my mask all the time. I wear it when I'm in concentrated areas. But I, I believe that, that, you know, I, I think we need to be protecting each other. And I think people aren't, aren't, they're not thinking about the people 
who don't go out because they got a, you know, a disorder or they have something that, that would cause them to get the virus and they don't feel comfortable. And, and, you know, we're only hurting other people by not protecting ourselves and them. Michael, thank you very much for the call. I think there are, are a lot of people that are worried about that. You specifically hear people talking about worrying about bringing the vaccine home to their kids. And we were hearing at the beginning that if the kids did get it, they wouldn't get that sick. And that's still pretty true. But you do hear of some cases where children do get sick. You wouldn't want that. No, all of the parents I know who have kids under the age of 12 have been consistently wearing their masks throughout the summer. It never stopped yeah. for that reason. I guess we, yeah, we, the rest of us should have taken that cue too. Now knowing uh, this is an evolving process, the more we know, the more we can guard against, but now knowing that we are fully capable of transmitting this with the same viral load as those who haven't been vaccinated. Sue in Arlington, thanks for calling. Hi. Hi. I love your show. I, Thank I, you. I am... Um, yeah. Um, so I'm a small business owner in Arlington. And for like I would say from the end of May, well, when I became fully vaccinated, I stopped. I My clients didn't have to wear masks, but I'm going to start having them wear a mask starting tomorrow. And um, just because of the Delta variant, yeah. it makes me nervous. And I don't want to ask people whether or not they're they're vaccinated. So I feel like I'll just have everyone wear a mask, and if they don't like it, they don't have to come into my studio. So, so you put like a so sign it. on the door. So you're not like a. It, you said you studio suit. So that means you let people in, yes, or does it mean that you just flow in freely? Uh, both. So yeah. people that make appointments, I'll let them know that they should wear a mask, and yeah. people that come in for classes ahead of time, I'll let them know they need to wear a mask, and then I'll just put a sign up. And I think most people still carrying masks or have them like I've got a bunch in my car. So I don't I don't think it should be a problem. I just don't want to ask people. I don't want to get into that whole business. Yeah. Are you vaccinated oh. or not? I know. So, I know. I know. So that's it. Sue, thank you very much for the call. You know, there are several places in Massachusetts where um, the, the, the virus seems to be really spiking. Suffolk County, which includes Boston, is one of them. Barnstable, which may be related to the, the uptick in Provincetown. Bristol County, which is uh, Fall River, includes Fall River, New Bedford. We just got an email from, from Thornton wondering... <laughs> He's very nervous, wondering if the Baker and, and Secretary, if Governor Baker and Secretary Sutters are doing anything about the risk to all of us uh, by the vaccination rates in Fall River and New Bedford, which uh, Ashley, it was Ashley that's uh, upset about this. And, and um, you know, I, th- I think those areas are particularly, people are particularly concerned. And we are in Boston, and, um, and I think people, I, you know, I went to the supermarket yesterday, and there were a lot more masks on than I'd seen in a while. Right, and we're starting to see you know, Sue will be in good company, depending on how she looks at this company. But Disney has started requiring masks yep. again uh, at both its theme parks in Florida and California. Apple is going to require masks to enter any of its stores. So we, we're headed in, in this direction. So it probably will be commonplace. And you want to feel that comfortable if you're a business owner, a restaurant right. owner, asking for the mask wearing. And I should say the governor's pointed out he's not doing anything yet, but he's watching the CDC uh, guidelines. This is where this masking stuff came from. And and he points out that except for Vermont, we're doing the best of anybody um, with with vaccinations. So we are the second best vaccinated. But still, um, you have people traveling here, particularly to Cape Cod. And, um, you know, it was very tragic what happened in Provincetown. Let's go to Diana Fairhaven. Hi, thanks for calling. Hey, Marjorie. Nice to talk to you again. Um, I feel as though the vaccination uh, passport that they're talking about, I think that we really need something like that. We just can't go on the honor system and that there should be a standard, uh, whatever you want to call it from a doctor. If you're medically unable to have, you know, a vaccination and any place you want to go into the grocery store or wherever, um, you need to show that you have been vaccinated or you have this card from the doctor and then you should, the person who is not able to get the vaccine really should be wearing a mask. However, um, how do you enforce that? Like I work at the grocery store in Fairhaven. Who's going to, you know, be the enforcer of that? Um, So it's very difficult. It's challenging. But I think that disincentives are going to work at this point. You know, you can't go to a Red Sox game if you don't show the card or whatever. 
And because it's selfish, and I'm really, really pissed off about it, really. Diane, um, Diane, so, I wonder how nerve wracking yeah. it is for you at work. You're, you're, you said you worked in a grocery store, so you're in con- you're contact right. with people all day long who may not be wearing masks. That's a little stressful, I would think. Well, it, it can be. I work, fortunately, in the back, way back cooler, cutting fruits and vegetables. Oh, and good. And I only good. run into people when I go out to, <laughs> to put the stuff on the shelf. But what I am seeing is, like your other caller said, um, uh, parents will come in with their kids, and the parents are also wearing the mask that yeah. the little kid has to as well. Yeah. And I think I've told you before that I give out stickers to these superhero kids. Oh, yes. Yes, um, yes. Yes. And I, I'm doing that again now. And I'm saying, you know, you, you kids are protecting your classmates and you want to go back to school. And I know it's been so hard and blah, blah, blah. And but I do. I'm encouraged when I see a parent wearing a mask because their child still has to wear one. Um, but, you know, people are selfish. They're not going to protect somebody else. And, you know, I'm enrolled for the million dollar giveaway. But a lot of people aren't because. You know, they're just not going to do it. If a million dollars doesn't entice them to do it, <laughs> then we need disincentives to do it. <laughs> so yeah, good anyway. luck in the drawing. When's it? When's the drawing? Is it today? We're going to find out today. I yeah. Don't, yeah. I think, yeah, I, yeah. One of, for five weeks, there's going to be a drawing, you know? So, Wish you luck, Diane. Anyway, I'm hoping my, I hope my good karma is out there with all my stickers, maybe. <laughs> you know what, Diane? I a million dollars and buy a lot of stickers. Diane, yeah. you, you still have four more chances. I just looked down to see a Weymouth man and a Chelsea teen have won the state's first Vax Million oh. prizes. So oh, we're, we're going to root for you for next That's week. That's awesome. Yeah, it is great. Okay. <laughs> all right, good to talk to you guys. Yeah, thank Bye-bye. you for the call. Thank you for the call, Diane. Uh, Here's an email from Marianne. She says, since the CDC has again recommended wearing masks in indoor situations, it would be great if many Americans could stop whining and recognize that wearing a mask could save their life. Pandemic's not over. In addition to vaccines, perhaps mask wearing could speed up the end of the pandemic. Um, You know, that is one of the issues here that, that, as you just said, the economy is threatened, right? If we have to shut down theaters, if we have to shut down museums, if we have to shut down restaurants and go back to where we were, where people, um, it, it's, it's just horrible to, to think about that. How ludicrous is it that you and I are having the same conversation that we were having this time <laughs> last year, talking about how, how are you going to enforce it? What do the people in supermarkets have to worry about when they enforce it? The fact that we don't know what's coming in the fall. Here, last year at this time, we had no idea that the vaccine was going to be here, that we would all, you know, we ha- all had the potential to be vaccinated, and we're right back in the same conversation talking about having to wear masks again should wear masks if we can and people now not getting vaccinated which could compromise everything all over again linda from boston thank you for calling hi marjorie jared uh, thanks for taking my call um jared i think you hit the nail on the head that this could ruin things for everyone i had to go to the rmv in watertown yesterday and i went and had to go up to there's a line outside within the mall, but just directly outside the RMV, a line of people and a security guard dressed like a police officer at the door to whom you had to speak to see, do I stand in this line? What do I do? And I had to go up to him. He was not wearing a mask. Now, I don't go in any public place without wearing a mask ever now. I just won't. I'm fully vaccinated, but it's just common sense. It's a, it's a nuisance, but it's simple you know, it's not a nuisance being on a ventilator. I mean, that's much worse than a nuisance. Yeah, that's yeah. So, okay, anyway, the point is that the security guard was not wearing a mask. And there's a sign in the window for the RMV that says, if you are fully, if you are not vaccinated, you should wear a mask. Well, I'm going to wear one anyway, even though I'm fully vaccinated. And many people were. The employees inside the RMV who direct you to go here, go there, are wearing masks. But the security guard, and then yeah. several others came over to him at one point who must also be security guards in that mall, also not wearing masks. I couldn't believe it. Uh, Linda, thank you for the call. I mean, there's been a lot of talk about how a lot of police officers are not uh, uh, masked. Uh, we've had those stories. And I said before, Governor Baker is not is not saying they have to be. But uh, Biden is saying federal, uh, federal uh, workers have, have got to be much more vigilant. And uh, he's insisting upon it. So I think that's... I, I think that's pretty good. I mean, it's 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 tough to go up to a security guard or a police officer and yeah, say, "Where's I your would mask?" Say so. <laughs> <laughs> you never know how that's going to turn out. I'm, th- I'm guessing not well. Spoiler alert. 
uh, if you have to do that. And we're also learning more about other companies. Google is pushing back its return to the office. Uh, Lyft postponed the return date. Twitter just shut down its recently opened offices. So, again, the, the ripple effect for uh, on this is huge when we can stop the spread just by wearing masks. And we know that the CDC has suggested that Suffolk County and here in Boston and several other counties in Massachusetts might consider that. We know we'll hear that from the governor in a couple days. Well, let's next go to Sandy and Sharon. Hi, Sandy. Hi. Um, Nice to talk to you, and I'll try and make it quick. Um, The thing that's driving me crazy is you don't know who's been vaxxed and and, and who isn't. And I recently met up with an acquaintance that I've been, that I've known for a long time and uh, went out to dinner and asked after dinner, just, regular conversation i assumed and you know what they say about that that she had been vaccinated i asked her which one she got and she said oh i haven't been well i can't even tell you the words that came out of my mouth (laughs) wow i must have driven driven home at 90 miles an hour i was so angry i said you had an obligation to tell me that before we met and did she did, did, did she elaborate one, why she didn't get it, and what two, why she didn't think yeah, it was incumbent yeah. upon her to tell you? Well, she didn't tell me that part, but I asked her why. I mean, this is an intelligent person with master's degrees, blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, she some of the stupid things that she read, you know, on the Internet. An intelligent person from an intelligent family with a, <laughs> we, with a, with a, with a spouse who had, um, who had bypass surgery. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Did, did the spouse get the vaccine, or are they just kind of yes. living on the edge here? No, 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 he got it. Oh, he got it. Okay. Yeah. But so, you know, I, I put it on. I have friends who work in nursing homes. I used to work in a nursing home who wrote to me recently and said, get your mask on. I said, I've already done it. I just went and got haircut today and went to the supermarket. The masks are, have been on for about a week. Sandy, thanks for that call. That's that's pretty bad. If someone you go out, meet a friend, and have dinner, or drink with them, or a cup of coffee with them, and they don't tell you. <laughs> yeah, that's bad. <laughs> yeah, Ted from Marshfield said he stopped wearing his lovely GBH mask after he was vaccinated. Now he has a miserable, enduring summer cold, and his beloved GBH mask <laughs> is right back on eight seven seven three zero one eight nine seven zero. We're talking about uh, masks. Uh, look like they are coming back. Uh, the CDC thinks that places with a higher risk, or a higher increase, I should say, of COVID, um, it, people should be masking when they're indoors in public places. And those places include Suffolk County, which, of course, includes Boston. Josh from AIR. What do you think, Josh? Hi. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. I, I did tell you, I'm so frustrated with this return to masks. I am a high-risk individual. I was in the ER six times during the pandemic for respiratory related illnesses, not COVID. I was in, in home sales. I am, I wore a mask every time I was inside. I, you know, laid low. I missed social events, got my vaccine as soon as possible. I don't want to go back to wearing a mask except for, you know, around children who can't get vax or hospitals, you know, those exceptions, but yeah. I don't see that. I don't see mask wearing is going to do anything but drag this out because frankly, the people who don't trust the vaccine don't really trust masks just going to bounce around the people who have always been playing by the rules will keep playing by the rules it's really not fair and i don't think it is going to have an effect well the effect it'll have is that it you know those of us who are masked and vaccinated won't be spreaders i mean so it does take it down a degree but i absolutely agree we are punishing as you say we're punishing the those of us who are vaccinated at this point well i mentioned uh, the president before and he's supposed to talk today about requiring all federal employees and contracts to be vaccinated or get regular testing and mitigation um, requirements if they're not vaccinated. So it's, there's all, a lot of federal workers. We're going to see how this pans out because those that may not be vaccinated, do you want to get tested all the time? Do you want to have to be, you know, the, go through mitigation, which I assume means wearing a mask and be watched hawk-like by your fellow <laughs> vaccinated employees? I think that may be, I think it may be time for the stick, I guess what I'm saying. And I guess Biden has decided it's time for a, a little bit of a stick too. I think it's past time for the stick if you ask me. <laughs> We're okay. <laughs> We're talking about the fan. Let's get out the rattan. Remember rattan? You're probably too young for rattans. When I was a kid, they had rattans in the schools, Jared. One really? wrong move right across your fingers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that didn't happen. 
<laughs> We're talking about the phantom of the outbreak. With mask mandates returning amid rising COVID cases, are you resisting? Are you masking up? Are you frustrated? The conversation continues on 89.7 GBH, Boston Public Radio. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. If you're just tuning in, we're talking about the return of the mask, taking your calls, asking you, are you masking up? Are you doing everything you can to avoid areas where wearing masks is required? Are you someone who's having to implement these new max guidelines? 877-301-8970, 877-301-8970. You know, Kay Ivey, who's the governor down in Alabama, and people may know, she's a Republican. um, uh, Alabama has really low, about 34% of people are fully vaccinated. And it's states like those where they're having the biggest outbreak of COVID because there's so many people that are unvaccinated. She just kind of let everybody have it. <laughs> she got disgusted. She said, folks are supposed to have common sense. Time to start blaming the unvaccinated folks, not the regular folks. It's the unvaccinated folks that are letting us down. So, you know, I, I think, and this is starting to happen in other Republican states. I mentioned before, uh, uh, um, uh, McConnell is finally uh, pushing vaccines big time. Even Ron DeSantis down in Florida, who has been against a lot of these uh, mitigation things, is, is turning around somewhat because of the race going through the roof. Well, what did Jonathan Gruber point out to, to us yesterday, you know, our, our economist talking about Who is one of the biggest champions for vaccines? President Donald Trump in Operation Warp Speed. So if this is breaking down along political lines, why would you not be supporting Donald Trump, who who made every effort and touted the effort that he was making to get vaccines to people in warp speed, as he said. But you do think if Donald Trump were now to say, hey, listen, we're in a we're in a crisis. Let's get. Get, let's get vaccinated. Let's get to this. I had the vaccine. My wife had the vaccine. Uh, we've all had, been vaccinated here. Let, let's do it. I think it would make a big difference because a lot of people that support him are people that are, are the ones who are not getting vaccinated. So I think he could have a huge impact. But um, so far, he's um, he gave a couple of half-hearted remarks about getting vaccinated, but he's certainly not taken to the stump about it. Kate from Cambridge, thank you for calling. Hi, Kate. Hi, guys. Um, <laughs> I was talking to a friend of mine who dates women. She had a great first date with this pretty lawyer at a bar indoors. At the end of the date, they go outside, and this you know woman asks, "Can I have a kiss goodnight?" And my friend asked about her vac status. And when the lawyer said she wasn't vaccinated, my friend turns white. She's like, "Wait, we were just inside with others, unmasked for an hour. What are you talking about? I'm not hugging you goodbye. Never. I'm not kissing. No, no." <laughs> And, if, so, and here's the thing. If if everybody gets to go shopping and out to dinner and gets to work, I wonder if the social lever is the last one we have. Kate, d- did the lawyer explain why she wasn't vaccinated? Oh, some baloney about, <laughs> you know, some nonsense. Yeah. God, Boy, I that's hope really... I hope your friend made her pay for the date. <laughs> Wait, where's, <laughs> where's Miss Manners when we need her? Do you remember Miss Manners? Judith Manners used to write yes. a column about good manners. Where's the good manners, Kate? And in Cambridge, Jim would be appalled. Bad manners all the way around. Inconsiderate, right? Well, there's got to be an app for that now, right? You, you, can't, you can't even come into my orbit unless you <laughs> press this button telling me that you've been fully vaccinated. Let yeah. alone try to kiss yeah. me. Yeah. I think we should, maybe we should get little badges, you know, that with, with a big V or a V with a cross through it so everybody knows, uh, an arrow through it, if you're vaccinated or not vaccinated. And, of course, I'm only kidding, but I think we're really going to be pretty frustrated with people that are saying they're not getting vaccinated, unless they have a very good reason. I mean, some people do have illnesses. The religious exemption, I don't buy it. I don't know why anybody else is putting up with that because, again, I, there, I don't think there's anything in the, in the Bible about vaccinations, is there? Or the Koran, for that matter. Not that I'm aware of. <laughs> and the Christian scientists let you have, uh, let you have uh, exemptions. Um, as long as it's for the greater conscience. good, yeah. Yes, exactly. absolutely. 877-301-8970. We're talking about the mask mandates. Let's next go to Alex calling from Boston. Hi, Alex. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Um, yeah, listening to this conversation, and it's honestly making me even more frustrated than I was before. I work in higher ed, and we just got brand new fall regulations that are still as wishy-washy as ever because 
we're trying desperately to follow CDC guidelines and, you know, wear masks when we're all in the office. Um, we're making accommodations for how often we're on campus and how often we're in office versus working remotely. But we're talking to students who, you know, spent their entire freshman year or, or you know, their, their senior year of high school um, off out of school and are now looking at possibly not being able to come to campus, especially if they're international students. Um, we just don't know where these, these new mandates are, are going and where this Delta variant is going. And heck, I hate to be bleak, but you know, any other variants that may come along. Um, and it is, it's, it's incredibly frustrating. It's, it's, it's heinous, <laughs> you know, yeah. to, to use an even harsher term, that, that those of us who are vaccinated and following the rules are the ones who are, are still bearing the brunt of, of folks who aren't. Alex, that was a great call. Thank you very much. I mean, the school factor, we haven't really talked about that, uh, but you know, the, the American Pediatric Society is now saying these kids should be wearing masks in school, certainly the kids that are, are little kids, but um, you know, we want schools to reopen. We talked endlessly about the toll taken by having no school for such a long time, kids falling behind, the social and emotional problems. Um, you know, I, it, it you, you're sorry that they're going to have to wear masks, but if things keep going this way, they're all going to have to wear masks in September, right? Yeah, and, and schools trying to decide their protocols about actually having this conversation again about whether kids come back in, in, in college campuses. Again, how are we having this conversation that we had a year ago still with vaccines in the mix? It's just... It is outrageous. It just can't go back that way. And especially, I, I mentioned this yesterday, New Repertory Theater here in Watertown, one of the big mid-level theaters in the Boston area, a very formidable theater company has announced its shutdown operations for the time being. I don't know if this means permanent closure, but at least for the time being, not planning a season going forward. This is already one, if it doesn't come back, but at least for this season, one major casualty of the art scene. We're going to see more of this if we have to go back into this retrenchment period and can't be out and about and making people feel not safe that they're out and about. We, 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 this just cannot be. Yeah, because you can't really, you can't make any money socially distancing in a theater. You just can't yeah. have that tiny amount of people and cover your costs. You can probably barely pay for the lights and the heat. Stephen Salem, what do you think? Hi, Steve, are you there? Hi. Hi. Yep. Um, I wanted to call yesterday when Dr. Kaplan was talking about um, the FDA, but uh, uh, having listened now to your two uh, former callers who said they were on a date or having dinner or something yeah, with people. I know. I mean, what kind of craziness is that? If, if that were me, I'd, you know, I'd have punched them. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm, uh, my wife works at the, uh, well, the hospital chain, she's gone back to fully on masking. She's not in patient contact, but uh, uh, I am in customer contact. I work in a big box store that was that never shut down during uh, the whole period of the of the COVID, the pandemic uh, closures. And I'm going back and masking up 100% right now because um, I just don't trust the, your last two callers. I just don't, don't trust anyone. And... Um, the, vol the masks uh, are, we do not wear masks at my workplace, uh, have to say we've been vaccinated. Uh, both of them, my wife and I have been 100% vaccinated. And, uh, but now I don't know who to trust. And um, just going back, I started out mentioning uh, Dr. Art. Um, he was saying yesterday, why can't the FDA just uh, say we can now uh, legalize mandates well yep. uh, remember this time last year you guys were just talking about it um we didn't have a vaccine well then we got vaccines uh provisionally approved but we have just now 50 percent of americans have one shot i'm, I'm probably off by a couple of percent 50 percent have um uh, both shots and 57 percent have at least one shot uh the population is 300 and what, $30 million right. people? The initial tests were, I think the biggest test was 90,000 people. We've just vaccinated 100 and have 1% negative results or whatever that thing's called, breakthrough cases. Yeah. 
that's the biggest audience of testees, do you call them, of subjects yeah. of a test ever. Why well, can't I, FDA say it's permanently approved because we've just finished the biggest test ever and it produced better results than the tests that we had when we gave the provisional approval? Steve, those are great points. Um, thank you very much. It's, it's, uh, it is very frustrating, I think, for people who are doing the right thing to have to deal with not knowing who's unmasked and unvaccinated. To, do we have time for one more call before we go to the break? I think we do. Where are we going, you guys? Let's take a super quick one. Alicia in Boston. Alicia in Boston. Thanks for calling. Got to be quick, though, because we're sort of short on time. Sure. Hi. Yeah, I, I'm fully vaccinated. I wanted to call in because I'm part of the Provincetown cluster. Oh. I went there with my family the 4th of July week, and that's uh, my wife and our, our two-and-a-half-year-old daughter. So we weren't out partying or anything. I was not wearing a mask, you know, like I think a lot of people were really happy to finally not be able, not having to wear them. I just wanted people to know that the Delta variant is real. Like I was fully vaccinated and I didn't even know I had COVID. I thought it was a cold. Um, so I didn't get tested for like 10 days. And I feel terrible about that. Um, and then I lost my sense of taste and was like, oh, man. So, yeah. Um, Alicia, how are you unfortunately, doing? Unfortunately, I think we need to wear masks. I'm fine. I'm fine. It, it was That's the other thing about being vaccinated. Luckily, if you do get it, I mean, most times it's going to be mild. So yeah. that is a good thing. But I think, you know, unfortunately, if you if you are concerned, you need to wear a mask. Um, and I don't know if we have time. The other thing I wanted to say, I do have a young daughter. She wore a mask from the time she turned two until maybe, you know, two years, six, six or seven months when we didn't have to wear them anymore. And I... I'm hating the idea of having to tell her she's going to have to put one back on. Yeah. Alicia, thank you very much for that call. We got it in under the wire. Well, that's a really good point, too, that Alicia's just reminded us. So many of so many people are getting what they think are summer colds, and that's a really good reminder that it may not be a cold, so if you get something like that, get tested right away so you're not carrying it to everybody else. But coming up, what a difference a DA makes. If Rachel Rollins is confirmed as the state's U.S. attorney, who could and should fill her place? Andrea Cabral joins us for that conversation and more on this week's edition of Law and Order. She's next on 89.7 GBH, Boston Public Radio. Public Radio, while many Americans tended diligently to their sour dough starters from months at home during the pandemic, the price of bread has been steadily rising. Higher supply chain and labor costs were part of the reason in the early days of COVID-19, causing supermarkets to run out of flour. Now, a mega drought is adding to the complications. Food policy writer Corby Kummer will join us to discuss this and the plight of the stressed-out restaurant worker. I'm Jared Bowen, and for Jim Browdy, as COVID cases rose in Boston over the winter, the Institute of Contemporary Art decided to close its doors even without an order to do so, an abundance of caution. The ICA is open again with a massive sculpture installation at the watershed and a full summer series of arts and music events. Jill Medvedow, director of the ICA, joins us for our reopening series, ahead on Boston Public Radio. of Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy is out. Jared Bowen, Executive Arts Editor at GBH, is here. Hello again, Jared. Hi again, Marjorie. We're going to do talk about the arts toward the end of the show, what's going on in Boston, about in the art scene, the museum scene. I can't wait to talk about that. Anyway, joining us on the line for this week's edition of Law and Order is Andrea Cabral. She's the former Suffolk County Sheriff and Secretary of Public Safety. She's now the CEO of Ascend. Hello, Andrea. Good morning. So, How are you? I, well, I'm good. How are you? I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was a okay. very deep pause. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> 
Well, let's talk about a, a really fascinating story here. Uh, Rachel Rollins, the, the, President Biden has nominated her to be the United States Attorney in Massachusetts. She'd be the first a black woman to ever hold this position. Um, uh, Joe Vernacki's written a column calling it a little bit uh, risky. Um, I know some people in Suffolk County are crazy about her, and they're not wild about her leaving. Uh, but what do you make of this whole uh, nomination? Well, I, I find it as fascinating uh, as you do, um, because I think, you know, Joan Vanaki has a point in terms of style. You know, U.S. attorneys are very different than district attorneys. District right. attorneys are really very autonomous. They are elected positions. Um, they don't answer to anyone. They don't answer to governors. They don't answer to mayors. They only answer to voters. And so, you know, there's sort of a much wider, um, <clears throat> there's much greater bandwidth for individuality if you're a district attorney. Um, and to be as outspoken as you want, I think being an, uh, a U.S. attorney is more constrained. Everything you do is within the confines of um, DOJ policy um, and practice, and historical kind of practice, including, you know, public statements. <clears throat> and D.A. Rollins is known for being outspoken. I think that's the point that uh, Joan Vanaki uh, is making, is that she speaks her mind, and, and that is, uh, you know, that's something that, um, you know, it's probably an, or should be an issue in terms of um, her being nominated, but not an insurmountable one. Um, so I think that was essentially the point of, of her column. Um, Adrian Walker also actually wrote a column uh, about, it was mostly about Dan, Dan Mulhern um, succeeding her, but he, he also somewhat references it. And I think if what you know, Joe Biden is looking for is some change yeah. within the U.S. Attorney's Office. You know, you do take risks if you're, if you're attempting to bring about sort of a, an ideal, not an, a strictly ideological change, but a cultural change um, in the U.S. Attorney's Office. It's been the same way um, for a very, very long time. I think, you know, Massachusetts is probably... Um, you know, ideologically a little bit different from lots of other places in the country. But I, I, I also have to believe this. There is no way that anybody gets nominated for a position like U.S. Attorney where they haven't been fully vetted by the FBI and where uh, the nominating person, and in this case it's none other than the President of the United States, isn't fully aware of um, both the risks and the rewards, for lack of a better term, of nominating that person, and they also tend not to nominate someone who they don't believe they can get through the confirmation process. Um, so that's that's not to say that everyone who's ever been nominated for such a position has gotten through the confirmation process, but they really go. Of, it's like when when a governor nominates someone for a judgeship, you really go as as far as you can go yeah. to, to <clears throat> assure yourself that they will get. Uh, the necessary votes to take the position. Yeah, so, I should just quickly say that she's she's known for um, she was very she was criticized by a lot of people, including some of Baker's people, because she was one of these so-called uh, pr- progressive prosecutors that declined to prosecute some low-level crimes, and it, it, it she was vindicated in that regard because people say, oh, this is going to be terrible, people are going to get away with with stuff, and it did show that the recidivism rate was lower when you didn't throw somebody into the system for low-level crimes, and she also threw out a lot of drug convictions, and she's one of of uh, uh, several uh, so-called progressive DAs that that Biden has nominated. But Tom Cotton from Arkansas, the senator, said uh, yesterday that he's going to do everything he can to keep her out of the position because he doesn't like her progressive perspective on on crime. Yeah. So about Tom Cotton, people should have some context (laughs) about... uh, He's your favorite, Andrea? Is he one of your favorites? (laughs) Oh, he's absolutely, uh, in my view, absolutely horrible. People may have forgotten, but Tom Cotton um, uh, objected to the nomination of Cassandra Butts when uh, Obama was president. Um, I believe it was for a judgeship. I think it it may have been a court of appeals judgeship. Um, But in any event, uh, Obama had nominated her. There was no reason not to pass her. He simply stood in the way because he could. Um, and while she was, while he held up her confirmation, uh, she ended up dying of cancer. And that I'm not ascribing the fault of that to him, 
but he was very proud and continued to be proud, even after she died, of standing in the way of her nomination. Tom Cotton is also the <coughs> senator who uh, the New York Times unfortunately made the decision to publish an incredibly fascistic op-ed by him yeah. uh, back when there were protests advocating for sending the military in, right. much like Mike Flynn uh, likes to promote, and uh, to save our streets and to protect our streets. Um, it was such an alarming op-ed, and the pushback was so significant, including from New York Times staffers, that uh, Bennett, who was the op-ed editor, resigned. Now, when was the last time you heard of something like that happening at the New York Times? They probably never should have uh, published it because right. it was, not because people aren't entitled to their opinions, but because it was fascistic and it was you know, hugely anti-democratic and it was coming from a United States senator. That's who Tom Cotton is. Tom Cotton is, I mean, people who call him a conservative are just missing the mark. It is far more extreme and dangerous than that. He would stand in the way of anybody that he could possibly stand in the way of um, that was nominated by Biden. And he doesn't have the data to back up this idea that um, uh, progressive policies, I would call them more equitable and just policies, have created a huge crime wave. And I'm sure that, you know, when he's making his case, he will uh, studiously avoid any references to uh, domestic terrorism by white supremacists, which is probably the hugest spike in, uh, in violence that we've seen in a long time, certainly organized violence like that. Um, he's not for safer streets. He's not a law and order person, as the way the GOP somehow has um, branded itself. He, he is basically for uh, the, con the social control of the behavior of the groups he does not like. Yeah. And so well, that's who Tom Cotton is. <clears throat> let's, get back to, let's get back to Rollins, though, because <clears throat> I don't want to make a case. Yeah. You know, I have, I have a question about this. You know, given that she's had autonomy as district attorney and leaving the speech and, and how vocal she has been aside – how much, uh, how much latitude do you think she would have if, uh, if she gained Senate approval in the U.S. attorney role? Because people have pointed out that she's been critical about you know, detention for immigrants and migrants, uh, but she could be in the position of defending ICE. Uh, but as you say, you point out there's probably also a signal here from the Biden White House that they want a culture change. So how much do you think she can shift? I don't know. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the short answer is that I'm not really sure. And I do think, though, that any uh, a change that can be effectuated, a lot of it will depend on how it happens. So, yes, you, 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 you know, if you're the U.S. attorney, you are going to be, you know, you may be in the position of defending um, other federal departments' uh, behavior. Um, Certainly Merrick Garland as AG seems to, even, even though he's receiving criticism, seems to be driven by the facts and the law. Um, he's kind of avoiding, you know, being driven by ideology. Um, so I think it's about the way you go about it, how you, you know, if, if you're smart, you, you take a look at the landscape and you really do want to affect some change. You look at the landscape critically and you really strategize around the areas where you can make that kind of change without... Um, creating so much pushback that it ends up standing in your way of getting anything done. And, you know, the, the mission of the DOJ, to your point, is the mission of the DOJ. You can't decline as a matter of practice to, to defend uh, agencies with whom you disagree. I don't think that there's an option there. I think within the facts of each individual case in the law, um, there is some latitude for U.S. attorneys to make some decisions, but probably not a huge amount. And I'm, I, you know, I, I, I agree that this, you know, this is this would be a challenge. But if but you don't get change um, unless you, you know, sort of step into that arena and see what it would mean to try to try to make those kinds of changes. So that may very well be what Biden is doing here. It's the easiest thing in the world is to say, oh, this is too hard. We probably shouldn't do it, which is exactly the way we've been dealing with the criminal justice system for centuries. And it has gotten us where we are today. So, Angie um, Cabral. So I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good balance to take a look at it this, that way. 
you know, I thought Adrian Walker, who's a great columnist of the Boston Globe, wrote a terrific piece talking about uh, D.A. Rollins wants her success to be Dan Mulhern. And he talks about the irony here that uh, uh, D.A. Rollins, who's black, wants the white guy to take her job because he's in line with her progressive uh, ideas of how to reform the DA's office. Remember, there was that whole ACLU campaign, what a difference the DA makes in terms of who gets arrested, who gets you know cer- certain sentences suggested, blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, Governor Baker, the white guy, is uh, putting – wants to get a uh, – is, is, is – Adrian Walker puts it, Baker, if he's going to be running for re-election, his ideal appointment would be a woman, a person of color. So the interesting dynamic, the outgoing black female DA wants the white guy, while the white guy governor is asking for a list of diverse candidates. So what's the governor to do here, Andrea? Because I don't think he was so on board with Rollins' progressive uh, perspectives when she started. No, but and I think that, you know, as the governor, he'll make his decision, um, you know, Without, and I won't say without regard to what um, D.A. Rollins wants, but I think, you know, his, the basis for his decision, which is both, um, which is political and otherwise, right, <clears throat> I think won't be affected um, if he decides to go uh, with somebody other than Mulhern. I don't think he'll be overly affected by the idea that he wouldn't choose Mulhern. Now, Mulhern, by everybody's account, everybody who's ever worked with him, um, has an excellent reputation and is, you know, well respected and um, has done very, very good community work. But the governor's not obligated to, to, um, you know, take the recommendation of the outgoing DA because he has a, he has different considerations in making that appointment other than what the outgoing DA wants to do. Yeah. But there is an irony there, um, and you know, s- somewhere in there, not. Not spoken, I think, it's, and I think this is always present, is that you, well, the two things that always strike me, that I always sort of hear in the back of my head, one is that if you're choosing, if you do choose a, a candidate of color to run a, a particular, for a particular appointment, that there's this sort of vague sense, sometimes it's less vague, um, that you're probably going to sacrifice something in terms of quality, and that always an- annoys me. Um, <laughs> yeah. But it's present al- yeah. almost all the time. I find myself, I found myself over the course of my career many, many times um, talking with people who think that it's a decision between a qualified candidate or a candidate of color as though yeah. those two things are mutually exclusive, and they're not. And so, you know, the, the context of this should be that Dan Mulhern is one of potentially many qualified people who could be appointed by the governor and the governor may have a priority of making an appointment of a person of color because historically and up until Ralph Martin, every single DA in Suffolk County was white and male. So the two facts are is that a person can be both qualified and a person of color, and there is a need based on historical exclusivity in terms of who used to get those positions to now keep that tab- those tables turning and, and keeping um, uh, a focus on the need for diverse candidates to also get those appointments. And that's sort of the, there's like that thread that just runs through, yeah. you know, uh, many of these conversations and even some of the columns. Um, it's a false uh, choice that they're putting forward. Yeah, this is going to be a fascinating one to watch. So Andrea Cabral, the rise of the Moors is back in the news. Be- to remind people, that's, of course, the group of about 10 men who were arrested uh, on July 3rd after a standoff uh, alongside the highway that fortunately went hours long but ended peacefully. Uh, but now they have turned around and sued the state police, the, uh, a judge, and media outlets, not including GBH, we should mention, uh, for its res- for those various entities' response to this. I think we know why they're doing this. They, they, they're they citing the Treaty of Peace and Friendship of 1787 between, <laughs> between the Empire of Morocco and the United States as the basis for their suit regarding defamation, discrimination, etc. Uh, but it did make me wonder why this doesn't happen more. I mean, it, uh, this this could be an effort to, to cloud the, the system in their case, etc., Yes, I mean, I, I mean, I think that um, I looked first for the name of an attorney 
that is representing them. And I didn't, the fact that I didn't see one uh-huh. um, is, a, is a pretty good indication that it's probably a pro se um, lawsuit filed mm-hmm. by, you know, one or more of the members uh, as plaintiffs, which, you know, is perfectly legitimate. Anybody can file, uh, represent themselves in a, in a civil lawsuit. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, I think, first of all, this appears to be, these beliefs appear to be deeply held, whether or not they are um, uh, legitimate in terms of how the law sees them is a completely different um, question. I mean, there's a, obviously, you know, you can, I believe that one or more is of Moroccan descent. That does not make you a citizen of Morocco, even if being a citizen of another country entitles you to the benefits of a very, very old treaty. Just being of descent, Moroccan descent, I, I'm not sure. I, mean, I haven't read the treaty. Maybe it makes a reference to descendants. Um, but I don't know how that would particularly be applicable. And, yes, when you live in the United States of America, the laws are supposed to apply to you. Um, and that includes firearms laws, and that includes having to have a license um, uh, for certain kinds of firearms. I would think certainly the AR-15 rifles um, that are referenced here. I know there's a reference in the story to not needing a firearm license for a rifle. I assume that is a different type of rifle, perhaps a hunting rifle. If that is in fact true, I'm sure that it does not in Rhode Island apply to an AR-15. Um, <clears throat> so their, their, their problem is that they're going to have to battle um, the specific charges against them. And I think that you're right. There was a lot of disruption during their arraignment. The, uh, Judge Karstetter had a really difficult time sort of getting through the arraignment because there was um, sort of a lot of back and forth between um, the defendants and she, and there was some shouting from the gallery. But this is a, this is a, a group that is incredibly ideological, Right, and they, this is their 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 ideology is what drives everything that they do, and and that I think is going to be a feature of both the criminal process here and the civil process here. But at the end of the day, the issue will be whether or not um, those firearms were properly licensed, and I'm sure there will be a part of this trial will be you know the disparate disparate treatment. There'll be a disparate treatment argument that you know they are somehow they are being treated differently than. Uh, similarly situated white defendants, there'll be a racial component to it, there'll be a um, sort of an anti-government point to it, there'll be a Second Amendment. They call themselves a militia. Well, actually, militias are illegal uh, in most states. Uh, I'd have to look up each individual in New England state, but uh, militias are illegal, and the Second Amendment's reference to a militia is not just sort of some independent roving militia. Well, Andrea, uh, um, may I ask you something you know. here? I mean, obviously there was a lot of talk about how you had the white guys with the guns at these state houses during the you know protests about COVID, right. and they didn't, they didn't get arrested, and, and there was a legitimate complaint. If they'd been black guys there, what would have happened? On the other hand, as someone who criticizes the state police a lot, I, I can see why the trooper might have been concerned. These guys are pulled over on the side of 95, 1 o'clock in the morning, there's 11 of them in camouflage, helmets, body armor, got a bunch of weapons. Turns out they had a three AR-15s, two pistols, a boat action rifle, a shotgun, a short barrel rifle, and hundreds of rounds of ammunition. You could see where the state police, you know, might have been a little concerned about these fellows, you know, it, it tell, announcing they were on their way to do training uh, um, for whatever, a militia. You know right. what I mean? Right. I, th- I think the trooper had a, yeah. had no, a no, no. reason. I do, I do, you know, I think, I think that, no, I do think that um, the response of the state police uh, was appropriate because Absolutely. they didn't know where this heavily armed group was going <laughs> exactly. and sort of to do what. And there is an issue of, of licensing. Now, you can bring five, if you are properly licensed um, in another state, you can bring your firearms to Massachusetts, and you have a certain amount of time before you have to register them. I think it is 60 days. Yeah. Um, if memory I serves. don't know. I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think I believe it's 60 days, but you have to. You have you have a, a certain amount of time to show proper registration in the other state and to properly register in Massachusetts. Here, the argument is is that. We are not staying, right? We're just we're just either driving through, or if we're going to be here, we're only going to be here for a short period of time, and then we're going back to the state that we came from. So the issue will be proper licensure in the state in Rhode Island, where it, it appears that most of them came from, um, and certainly proper licensure for anybody who, in that group who actually uh, 
resides in Massachusetts who is in possession of a gun. So it's not an uncomplicated case. It's not, you know, too complex to be, you know, understood at all. But, yeah, there will, there will be so many – there will be enough complexities in the case inherent in sort of the law and the facts. And when you add the motivations and the, and the ideology, it, it, it's going to be something to watch this play out. So, Andrew, just one quick last question for you to get your take on we – there's been a lot of conversation this week about the testimony we saw in Washington about the July 6th attack and the really emotional, resonant testimony from those officers and then the response from the GOP, a lot of the GOP, I should say, not all, uh, who either dismissed it or chose to ignore it, uh, refuted it, called them crisis actors – uh, what does this mean for the party going into the midterms when one of their major platforms is being the law and order party, as we saw especially coming out of the last election where Donald Trump and a lot of the party were saying, we're going to keep you safe in your neighborhoods, which are going to be subject to terror. Uh, but then they turn around and respond like this with these officers uh, appearing. Yeah, it's, it's ironic that they – you know, have been enjoying this reputation as the law and order party for so long. And I, and while, you know, the, what happened on January 6th still is just um, devastating and traumatic, at least uh, for, me, for me personally, um, I am grateful for the fact that it has um, forced into stark um, exposure the lie that is this idea that the GOP is the law and order party, um, because they literally, in order to, to remain in Trump's good graces, and it can't, they, you can't find anything more craven and cynical and self-interested than this, um, to stay in his good graces, turn their backs on the very people, some of whom actually lost their lives, but all of whom risked their lives, to protect them that day. And to sort of then ignore um, or diminish, and in, to, in some cases even demean, the very experiences these officers talked about having, and which they testified to, was devastating testimony um, at that hearing, <clears throat> demean that entire experience. There's, I cannot remember the lawmaker's name, but there was one of them that, um, you know, sort of goes on this little tour talking about how it, they were just friendly tourists and all of this other stuff, only to have the photographs emerge of him helping to barricade the doors, um, I think the very doors through which Ashley Babbitt tried to um, uh, enter uh, the chamber, helping the Secret Service barricade the doors because they were, they were terrified that this group was going to come in and kill them. I don't know how you, how you can be that much of a hypocrite. I don't know how you can literally experience running through the hallways of the Capitol to safety, trying to find a place where this group cannot find you. And then in the immediate aftermath, somewhat acknowledge that, yes, this was Trump's doing and this was wrong and, and we were all scared. But as time goes on and more and more pressure is applied, simply try to pretend that it didn't happen. And I think this is going to you know, go down in history as an excellent example of of GOP hypocrisy. That's all it is. Everybody could see what was happening. There is plenty of evidence as to what, is ha what, what happened that day and who is responsible. And they just have decided that it's not something that um, it's inconvenient for them to acknowledge how just how horrible this was and how anti-democratic and treasonous this was. So they're Andrew, just going to pretend are, uh, that it didn't <clears throat> happen. And, you know, it, it's unfortunate. I, it just... You know, but I hope that law enforcement can see this. I hope that, you know, law enforcement traditionally tends to be, you know, tends to vote Republican and be more Republican. I hope everybody's paying attention to this because you can't have a better example of how expendable yep. the GOP really does think they are. Andrew, we're up against the clock, but thank you so much as always. Appreciate it. Sure. Okay. Thank you so much. Andrea Cabral joins us every week for Law & Order. She's the former Suffolk County Sheriff and Secretary of Public Safety. She is now the CEO of Ascend. Coming up, if you can't stand the heat, don't just get out of the kitchen. Leave it altogether. Overworked and stressed out, it's a mass exodus for restaurant workers. Food writer Corby Cumberland joins us to talk about more problems for an already stricken business. Keep your dial on 89.7 GBH, Boston Public Radio.
Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Joining us in line to go over the latest headlines at the intersection of food policy and industry is Corby Kummer. Corby's the executive director of the Food and Society Policy Program at the Aspen Institute, a senior editor at The Atlantic, and a senior lecturer at the Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. Hello, Corby Kummer. Hello, Marjorie. Hello, Jared. Hello. Great to talk to you. So, so Corby, tell us about these What's going on in the restaurants? People are just walking out in the middle of their shift saying, I've had enough. Take this job and shove it. (laughs) There is so much opportunity now for workers. And there's been a real shift in worker solidarity in the union movement and the idea that I can't take this and I want to leave. I'm not being treated well. But so much of it in the restaurant industry is uh, workers left. During COVID, they found cheaper places to live. They liked other jobs and other places better. And so when the restaurants were finally able to reopen, and so many did not, we have to have a moment of mourning for the hundreds of thousands of restaurants that shut down permanently. But those that did have been scrambling to find workers. Um, The easy answer, and it's the one I always give, is if you're having trouble, pay them more. Um, I certainly believe in that. But of course, restaurants are desperately trying to repay their debts, pay their rent, um, keep alive. And so they're not always able to pay that more, but that much more. But that means that workers who are there are overworked. They're working several jobs at once. They don't have time. They don't have time to establish a relationship with diners that will result in bigger tips. So they're feeling stressed every which way, and they're walking out in the middle of shifts. You know, you always hear that the margins in restaurants pre-pandemic are really small and that liquor is where a lot of these restaurants make the bulk of their money. So obviously, if they're going to pay restaurants, uh, workers more money, they've got to raise the prices significantly. So that's an issue, too, I would think. Sure, it's pricing, and we've talked about that often, about the idea of including tips in menu prices. It drives diners away, um, even though they wind up paying the same thing with tips. They just There's some kind of sticker shock that they won't do it. So there's not always the ability to raise prices, uh, but it's so much the idea that restaurants are always strapped. They're always like one payroll away from missing their deadlines and not being able to pay. Um, One of the lessons I hope that's gonna emerge from the pandemic, and this is easier to say than it is to do, is before you go into a restaurant, have a business plan for like two or three years that accounts for lots of disasters and up and down cycles. Yeah, I've experienced both so far this summer, restaurants where you you waited an hour for your meal and then restaurants where it felt like everything was as it was in the before times. Do you know how this is breaking down, how restaurants are able to keep it going or making it work? Is it paying more? Is do you, do you find it's or do you believe it might be more geographical? I think so much was geographical. You had that very good segment yesterday about Provincetown and the challenges that it had when it reimposed masks and the absolute urgency of Cape Cod restaurants uh, making a year's worth of income in about three months. The season is so short. So I think it really depends on the locality. Uh, it depends on worker and safety and, and mask mandates, which are coming back. And I think that's a good thing. Um, but so much of it is which owners had business plans in place in the beginning and then which ones were able to pay uh, to get um, restaurant relief since that's been such a challenged program. So I think it's very much by locality. So Corby Kummer, um, please educate me about GMOs. I thought I was not supposed to like GMOs. Now I'm reading this piece about these GMO'd up tomatoes. It sounds like they've got their like little anti-inflammatory machines full of all <laughs> these, this great stuff. So I, I, am I wrong? Should I embrace the GMO movement here? Yes, Marjorie, you should. And this is going to get me into so much trouble with my organic friends. And that's because my um, Food and Society program at the Aspen Institute devoted almost two years to uh, writing a draft regulatory framework for the Food and Drug Administration, kind of at their request um, or their very willingness to review it. What does that mean? It means that 
So much of what's being done in GMOs is not transgenic. It's not introducing a fish gene into a tomato as was notorious at the beginning. It is speeding up conventional breeding techniques, um, cutting by decades what it would take to improve growth yields, drought tolerance, lots of good things. Um, and so I, I believe that it's not only that, it's that the cat's out of the bag, the horse is out of the gate, whatever, or out of the barn, whatever it is. So much of our food supply now includes genetic, genetically modified ingre uh, ingredients that what's most important is building public trust in it. And the way to do that is having regula regulations in place from the Food and Drug Administration about what is the important testing that gets done, how long does it take, what's the process. So I think it really is, they really are a good thing um, that fears are overblown as the subhead of a very long piece in the New York Times Magazine by Jennifer Kahn said. I completely am sympathetic to a lot of activists who um, are often criticizing the agricultural system more than they are this individual technology. They're not fighting science, they're fighting monopolies and capitalism often. That sounds like I'm criticizing it. Monopolies and capitalism can be very bad for small farmers. I believe completely in defending small farmers, but it's misplaced to attack genetically modified plants when you really want to um, attack big agriculture and the underlying growth system. Well, to ask you to maybe put on your ad exec hat for a moment and it, it does sound like there needs to be this rebranding because I like Marjorie just assumed that that was a no-go zone you want to stay away from that so we have to re we re-educate ourselves so so what are the bullet points about what we're actually eating that is good for us with GMO foods I am a right-minded um, non-profit fundraiser I am not an ad exec Jared how dare you ask <laughs> you're partially minded but I will say that one of the main obstacles I encountered because what's interesting is so many people on so many sides of this argument are actually in agreement that um, plants can be improved, including for flavor, um, for things that we care about, and that it's the system of um, big ag and subsidies that favor huge farmers that is really at fault. But, you know, there was an insight that kept coming up, up, up and again at the beginning of genetic modification and plants and genetic engineering, all we heard about was if you get Roundup Ready plants, you can put money into Monsanto's pocket. Who wanted to do that? Um, it was all about huge commercial gains for companies we didn't care about or believe in. There wasn't something that people wanted. So Jared, yes, it needs a rebranding and that rebranding should be here are more antioxidants in your tomato. Here are cancer-fighting compounds that you always liked, but Marjorie didn't like having a ton of kale, and so we could just um, put more of it into your one serving of kale that you're willing to eat, and you'll get all your vitamins on all these antioxidants. In other words, Jared, give people something they actually want a juicier peach that doesn't rot in storage, better strawberries that actually taste good. Um, you know, all around us, so the minute I think strawberries, I think labor practice is the way farmers and pickers are treated. That's an entirely different question from what we're talking about, which is improved plants. But yes, there's a huge image problem because it's just been rapacious. I mean, the perception is it's been rapacious companies lining their pockets at the expense of small farmers and consumers. See, Corby, that, that executive reach you just did, that came a little little easily, I think, for somebody who protested there. <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> okay, we're talking to Cor Corby Kummer, our food man. So we've been hearing about these terrible droughts in many parts of the country, That even some of the parts of the wine country can't get insurance anymore because uh, things are so dry out there and the crops are in terrible shape. All the, the, the... So what's going on with the mega drought in bread? Oh, um, you know, there's, so we were talking about the big problems in big ag system. There's a very long article in the counter about droughts that are decimating um, 
wheat crops, especially in like North Dakota, very dry uh, conditions that mean maybe 16%, one six percent of the crop will be usable. So the prices are probably going to go up of wheat. This is about climate change and the need for sustainable plants that are more drought tolerant, often genetically engineered. <laughs> so this is a great segue. But one of the really good insights of this piece was federal crop insurance is what saves a lot of big farmers. It's a very, very criticized system because it's what people criticize about subsidies to corn and rice and uh, farmers when it's really going to ethanol. But they interviewed a small farmer, one of the new artisan farmers who's growing uh, heirloom wheat and trying to um, grind it at a local, even urban mill with higher rents, but it's incredibly fresh flour that we who love bread, especially during the pandemic, can go out and buy from a local store. Uh, what a farmer who is trying to enter this small artisan supply chain said was, crop insurance isn't good for small farmers, it's only good for big farmers. So getting back to the drought, it's not really going to infect those of us who care about our croissant and our muffins in the morning. Sure, the bakeries might be paying a little more for wheat, but as one of the artisan bakers they interviewed said, I often have to pay much more for butter when there are dairy shortages or there's fluctuation in dairy prices. Uh, Marjorie, our beloved butter and cream, those prices fluctuate. So she was saying, I expect prices to fluctuate. Um, but the real problem is, again, big ag not being um, ready for droughts, not being drought resistant. And then I think around the world, if wheat prices go up, it's always going to be the poorest people who have the least money for food who will be the most affected, not us who care about our cost on prices. <laughs> well, and do we have the sense we were talking about this with Juliet Kayam yesterday? Is this the new normal? Is, or, or how, and talking about business models like restaurants, do they have to start to anticipate that there will be drought after drought, summer after summer, so that crops are going to be so uh, devastatingly impacted? Yep, there are ways around this, and those are drought-resistant plants changing or changing the way you farm to more sustainable practices. There's lots of wonderful climate-friendly ways of farming. They're often more suited to small farmers than big farmers, but as Tom Philpott, uh, the wonderful writer for Grist, pointed out in his book, Perilous Bounty, there are plenty of big farm-friendly ways of farming for to account for climate change and to be uh, much more concerned with the health of the soil, which is really important for all these droughts we're talking about. If you're careful about the health of the soil, uh, all of your fields will resist drought better. And if you buy seeds that are maybe more expensive, maybe less high yielding, but are really drought resistant or more sustainable and not just bred for high yields and lots of irrigation, then you can do fine, too. There are ways of changing farming to improve all this. We're talking to Cubby Corby Kummer, our food man. So we've been talking a lot about the Olympics, not in the, in the oyster context, but this is a really great story uh, out of Japan about the uh, oyster tragedy they encountered at the Olympics for the rowing venue. So <laughs> tell us the about... The oyster tragedy of the Tokyo Olympics, yeah. which is that... Um, that they had to spend 1.28 million to fix an oyster problem in the bay. So, okay, so for canoeing and rowing events in the bay, mm -hmm. they wanted to keep the water clear, and they thought um, we're going to have uh, filter feeders, which are oysters and mollusks. We're going to have lots of these filter feeders cleaning out the water, and so there won't be as many waves. It's going to stabilize the tide. To have big magaki oysters um, growing around there so it's going to stabilize the waters and make an even playing field for the Olympic competitors and rowers especially and instead the oysters attach themselves to these very important floats and drag them down so it was um, all these important floats weren't floating anymore 
And so they destroyed millions of oysters, 28,000 pounds of oysters. And the worst thing was they had no way or mechanism of selling them. So all these perfectly good oysters got thrown out. That doesn't make any sense. All those oysters, which are a delicacy in Japan, and they had to be thrown out. That, no, that makes no sense. Yeah, well, these in particular. But, you know, anyone who wants to consume fresh oysters knows that it should go through a system in which they're either treated by what's called high pressure, high pressure pasteurization, which can kill um, bacteria without affecting flavor too much, or they actually go through the kind of viral testing that every big new shipment went through in, in legal seafood and I hope still does under its new owners. So it's already a complicated marketing system for oysters. And the Tokyo, yes, they're incredibly expensive, rare delicacies, but they hadn't grown them to go through that safety check system. Well, I just have one question uh, more about this. You know, oysters are not that heavy. So, I mean, are we talking about thousands of oysters beneath each one of these uh, rowing things to, 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 to basically drown them or, or what? I mean, that takes a lot like of oysters. This science fiction? You know, like <laughs> barnacles? You've seen yeah. barnacles attached yes. to boats? Yes, yes. Imagine like thousands and thousands of these on one small, poor piece of wood or plastic or whatever those floats were made of, dragging it down. I just think of the oysters thinking, we're going to we're gonna do it. We're going to take down the Olympics. We're yeah. going to take over the world next. We're going to compete in the Olympics. That's right. The heck sucked, with those rivals. Sucked, there is just sucked right down there. It's, it's a terrible, terrible situation there. And then thrown out, I tell you. Well, at least Poor- now that we know we've been saved from gastrointestinal woe, <laughs> that's, that's why they right, had to be Jared, thrown out. It's your safety that they had in mind. All right, I understand. Well, on a more serious note, uh, Mario Batali, there's, we, we were following that case, cases, I should say, and the accusations against him, this big celebrity, powerful figure in the restaurant world in New York and right here in Boston. And there's a settlement reached. Tell us, tell us how that has been resolved at this point. So at this point, uh, the former Battaglia Bastianich, which has changed its name as uh, Joe Bastianich, the longtime partner, um, made Mario Batali sell his shares to them uh, and changed that. Um, the Letitia James, the attorney general of the state of New York, uh, said that Battaglia Bastianich permitted an intolerable work environment and allowed shameful behavior. So I think that the there's many, many stories of women being uh, trading notes on how they could have different routes to the bathroom to avoid cat calls and harassment from the male staff on their way to the bathroom, being told by managers to get breast implants so yeah. that they would look better. And this kind of intolerable, not uncommon, but that doesn't make it any better work environment for women. Um the, the larger picture is, first of all, that an attorney general of a big and important state is calling out in very harsh terms a work environment and saying, we're not going to tolerate this. I picked a big, high-profile company, and I hope what she said someplace else, I haven't read the whole statement, is they are not alone. This is part of the restaurant industry, and it has to stop, and we're going to pay attention to this um you know and aside from the really awful individual stories there was a very very strong quote i thought which was from one of the participants in the lawsuit and she said even though twenty thousand over five years is laughable to most it feels like 20 million to women like us (sighs) they have thought it's so hard for them to go on the record and give testimony it takes so much courage to join these suits, that this kind of recognition and powerful statement by Letitia James is what should influence the restaurant industry. So what is Mario Batali doing now? I don't know, except Kim Sievertson, who wrote this update in the New York Times about the $600,000 settlement of the company, had done a piece over a year ago. It's pre-pandemic. And also a New York magazine reporter went out to um, a Traverse City, the Traverse City area where uh, Batali has a has a nice um, lake house. And he's just been there, I think, doing community work, thinking about what he can do for charity. But uh, to my knowledge, he hasn't been in New York. He's been 
there in Michigan so, trying to rebuild his life. So can he ever rebuild his life by coming back to the restaurant business, or is this just it for him? You know, I don't know. I would doubt the restaurant business. I would think it would have to be in charitable works and cultivating uh, young people out of remove and using his influence to help an association that he doesn't run, um, help young workers. So there's lots and lots of things he could do. But as far as lending his name and his visibility, that'll be problematic. Yeah, because there's always that question of when have you uh, uh, paid your debt? And is this a life sentence or is this not a life sentence? And it's and not a settled question. It's not a settled about question. For many people in different cases. Yeah. And I should say that we, I mentioned Boston. That trial is coming up. Um, at least the next uh, the next phase of that, the next hearing is September 15th. So as, right. I, as that continues for him right here in this city for what happened here, yep. allegedly. Corby, thank you very much. As always, beautiful yeah. background there. Are you here? Or are you out at the Aspen? I'm in fabulous Jamaica Plain. And oh, Jamaica Plain. Okay. CDC's updated guidance. Jared I... and I would have been in the same studio today. <laughs> okay. Deprived. Yeah, that's right. We, we we would have all been. Yeah, I know. Well, we keep hope alive. We believe in masks. We believe in masks. Especially for restaurant workers. Yeah, and hopefully this uh, will be will be all together um, before too much longer. Corby, thanks yeah. again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Corby Cummer joins us regularly. He's the executive director of the Food and Society Policy Program at the Aspen Institute, a senior editor at The Atlantic, and a senior lecturer at the Tufts Friedman School of Nutrition, Science, and Policy. Well, coming up, it's time for All Things Tech with Andy Anatko. Keep your dial on 89.7 GBH, Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy, and joining us to go over the latest headlines at the intersection of tech, policy, and commerce is Andy Anatko. He's a tech writer and blogger. You can find his work at anatko.com and follow him at anatko. That is I-H-N-A-T-K-O. Andy, great to talk to you. Great to be here. So let's let's start with what you started with in your memo to us, this story about this is a private Israeli security company that's using this very uh, powerful phone spyware um, to, I guess, spy on on politicians, journalists, people that are active in in in, in protests, and and regular Joe and Janes apparently, if they want to. What is this all about? Oh, this is this is a big, big scandal that keeps getting bigger and bigger. Uh, it was broken last week. Uh, there was a, 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 a Paris-based nonprofit journalism group called Forbidden Stories that found out that uh, there is a uh, an Israeli security firm that has been well known for a bunch of years called the NSO Group uh, that uh, has this product called uh, called. Uh, uh, they, they, have, they have this product called a Pegasus. That is, it's a piece of spyware that, as a, a nation state, meaning a government, foreign government, can buy this software. It can cost millions of dollars to use specifically against terrorism and against uh, state level crime. Uh, and that's how it's supposed to be used. However, the, uh, the research being done by Forbidden Stories, uh, uh, buttressed by 17 international uh, uh, journalism groups plus the uh, plus uh, human rights organizations, have discovered that th- apparently this company has not been very careful about monitoring how it's being used. And they've discovered that it's being used for all kinds of crimes against humanity, no less, uh, that uh, it's being uh, it's been used to target uh, uh, government officials, uh, dissidents, uh, journalists, uh, people who are just simply in the social circle of journalists. Uh, basically, if you are the head of a sort of a tin plate, uh, uh, tin plate uh, <laughs> country with uh, horrible human rights, human rights records, this Pegasus software was being used and abused to basically settle scores, settle onto power, 
uh, and basically do all kinds of nefarious stuff. It was found, for instance, uh, that uh, the uh, the uh, a, a group of uh, Mexican government researchers discovered that the previous president had spent over sixty million dollars of the government's money to use this buy the software and use it to keep tabs on political enemies, journalists, activists, uh, all kinds of people like that. Uh, even creepier, uh, it was discovered on uh, the phones of uh, of uh, the fiance of Saudi journalist uh, Jamal Khashoggi, who, as you remember, was murdered. Uh, because of his coverage of the Saudi government. And so this is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. It's because uh, it's been found on uh, specifically on 37 different phones, uh, but uh, it could be, they, they believe it's been installed on at least 900. And they believe that the list of potential targets uh, numbers in the, in the tens of thousands. So this becomes this is getting bigger and bigger, bigger as it goes. Just this week, there there actually had to be a meeting uh, between uh, the uh, between the uh, uh, Israeli uh, defense chief and the French defense minister, basically to patch things over because uh, the president of France, his his phone was found to be one of the numbers being targeted by the software. It's unknown whether the software was actually successfully installed on his phone, but this is he was his number was part of a list of numbers that were known to be of interest to someone who had purchased the software. Well, Andy, that's one of the concerning things is just talking about President Macron and whether it was installed on his phone. It sounds like it can be done very easily. You don't even have to necessarily, from what I read, open an email attachment or do any of the things we're encouraged not to do when we don't know who the sender is. So how is it that this company was able to do this and do it so easily? And is there a consequence for this discovery? Uh, absolutely. There's, uh, you're absolutely right. And one of the scary things about this is that it was uh, really state-of-the-art technology. This wasn't just a bunch of people who are creating a, a, a ransomware or a cyberware uh, crime product. This really is essentially like a, a, a state-sponsored weapon, even though it's a private company. And yes, it could be installed on an iPhone or on an Android device without even uh, some, tricking someone into uh, hitting a, a, an email link uh, or answering a text message, literally. It was exploiting weaknesses deep, deep, deep in the core of these phones operating systems so that just the fact that this message was received by this phone means that this, this uh, malware was actually installed. Uh, and now, uh, as far as repercussions go, uh, NSO Group has said that, hey, it's not our fault. Uh, we se we uh, we sell this stuff to, again to nation states for uh, again state crimes and state terrorism. It's designed to save lives. It has saved lives in the past. Uh, they have noted that they are also they they have also pulled the license or you know essentially defused the software from people who violate the the user agreement that it's sold with. As a matter of fact, after after they found out that. Uh, again, the fiance of uh, Jamal Khashoggi had her Khashoggi had her uh, phone and, uh, phone infected. Actually, the person who the, the individual who had rights to that software lost rights to that software as well. But basically, they're saying we have no responsibility for this. They have not broken any laws because they were operating uh, under the permission of uh, of the, uh, the the country that they're operating in, Israel. And now it seems as though the biggest uh, problems being faced by this are again Israel who has to now deal with all this diplomatic uh, diplomatic uh, issues uh, because there are a lot of different countries that are very very upset with them right now and they have to basically say I know that the United Nations says that we're supposed to take we're supposed to oversee any uh, we're responsible for any human rights problems that any of our companies build, uh, doing business inside our our nation uh, are take take advantage of but uh, <laughs> there are limits to what we were able to do but we are on it right now and we're trying to make amends so this is a very very big issue it's becoming worse and worse and worse as more allegations and more information continues to surface Andy how do people figure out if this is on their phone it's incredibly unlikely uh, that it could that it'd be on your phone. Again, it, this isn't like a virus that keeps spreading. Uh, you have to visit an infected website. You have to specifically be targeted. There is a list of 50,000 uh, names, mostly, again, politics, uh, mostly in business, mostly in uh, in activism that were found this way. There are techniques that are difficult to explain in, in less than uh, five or ten minutes, but uh, if you have an iPhone specifically, uh, this malware will leave behind telltale signs uh, that it has been tampered with in this way. Uh, and if you do, I, I, hate to, I hate to be so helpful as to say uh, Google, NSO, and Pegasus, 
uh, but they, there are detailed instructions on how to do it. Once again, it's not, a, it's not an app you can download that will check your phone. Uh, the good news, however, is that if you, if you, for instance, have an iPhone and you realize that, gee, Apple seems to push out an immense number of, of, of critical updates to the operating system over the past week, uh, they haven't acknowledged that they did all the stuff to patch all the security weaknesses that were being exploited uh, by the spyware. But the consensus opinion is that, yes, they, they're, they did this to patch all the holes that were suddenly discovered uh, once they found out exactly how the spyware works and where the vulnerabilities lie. Or, you know, you have it when there's a SWAT team outside of your house. Either or. <laughs> My goodness. God. Yeah, that's anyway, right. uh, well, yeah. so let's talk about a little more security with your email, at least, coming from DuckDuckGo. What, what are they doing? They're, they're, they're really helping. Uh, DuckDuckGo is very, very famous as if, if you download their, if you use their browser on your phone, on your devices, instead of uh, Safari, instead of uh, Chrome, it will make sure that it keeps your, your connection secure and private uh, from basically it makes sure that all the stuff that the companies put onto websites to make sure, to make sure they can track where you go uh, on one, what from one website to another, all that stuff gets defeated with uh, DuckDuckGo, whether they're using their browser extension or their own browsers. They They've decided to go one step farther, and they're actually now extending to a, a new product they're calling email protection. Uh, if you go to spreadprivacy.com, you can sign up for this. They're going to be launching it in a couple of weeks. And the, the, if all you get out of this is a new email address at duck.com, that itself would make it worth <laughs> signing up for this. To be Andy at duck.com, I, I, that's all I want from this. But the, but the great thing about this is that uh, they, they, they don't act as an email provider. What they do is they act sort of as a relay, sort of as a middleman between uh, where, whoever is sending you email and your actual real true-to-life inbox, whether it's Gmail, whether it's Outlook, whether it's whatever. And what it does is it will just simply scrub all the incoming email uh, free from any of these trackers that are in there. One of the most insidious ones is, you might have heard of the, the, the invisible pixel trick, uh, where uh, if you have a piece of marketing email, uh, it might have a, a one pixel-sized uh, GIF file uh, that is invisible to your eye. However, it has a unique identifier for it. So, And when you open it, whether it's on your desktop or whether it's on your phone, uh, the, the, uh, the, the server that hosts this little unique pixel file it knows that, oh, well, Andy Anako just opened and read this email. This must be a very, very good valid email address. Also, I know for a fact that he opened and re read it, so that's, a, that's good information. We're going to keep marketing at him. So we'll strip out technology like that so when it actually live, uh, lands in your actual inbox, it will be completely stripped free of all that sort of stuff. Uh, it's going to be a free service. Uh, they're, they're not acting, once again, as your email provider. You have to have your own email address. But the email address you provide to like a, a newsletter to uh, if you sign up for a service or whatever, you can, again, just give them your, your duck.com address. Another cool twist they're doing, though, is that it will also automatically, it will also easily generate a burner email addresses that will just will point all the, all the way back to your original uh, mailbox. So that even if they try to spam Andy at duck.com, it's not going to work because it's just this one email address that's, a, again, it's a burner. If they, if they, won't, if they won't let me contact customer service, they won't let me just access the site without giving them a sign up and giving them an email address. I can give them this burner address that is technically a real address, but has absolutely no connection to anything that I want to say or do. So it can't hurt me. So this is, this is another reason why we kind of want to have a new sort of like federal, <laughs> federal award, federal like uh, uh, American pride award for DuckDuckGo because they're doing such wonderful work and they're trying to protect everybody's activity on the, on the web, on the internet and not really charging much for it at all. Have you any idea of how popular it's become? I mean, are people signing up in uh, great numbers? I don't have any information about uh, about the email protection service. They've just they just announced it last week, uh, and once again, they're not going to open it up for another couple of weeks. So you have to go to spreadprivacy.com, sign up, and I believe they're going to be doing a limited rollout. That as they as as they increase capacity, as they get the uh, the the ability to service more and more people, they will be inviting more and more people in uh, to the service. Uh, but it's it's going to be worth looking into. This is this is something that's going to be more and more important as time goes by. It's so important, in fact, that Apple uh, is introducing, uh, in, as part of the operating system upgrade that they're doing in uh, September, uh, email security is a big, big pillar in, in the feature set, uh, so much so that 
Uh, the the built-in uh, email browser will will do similar things to this. Also, for a small fee to your, to your iCloud Plus account, it will also again put a sort of a middleman between your your machine, your device, and the rest of the internet, so that everything any identifiable information gets scrubbed clean on the way through this little middleman service that Apple is is providing as part of iCloud. So yeah, it's it, the, the stakes are much much higher, and the weapons that are being provided to <laughs> ordinary users are getting more and more powerful, thank God. Andy and Anaka, let's talk Google Doodles for a moment. Those are <laughs> those, those great little pieces of art that just randomly appear one day when you go to do a Google search. And coincidentally, I spent a lot of time talking about them and thinking about them this week because on Open Studio on Friday, we're featuring the artist Aqua Holmes, who has a new show and exhibition at the Museum of Fine Arts. And in 2015, she was the artist who created a Google Doodle of Martin Luther King Jr. marching in Selma, Alabama, uh, that was used. And then suddenly, this artist from here in Roxbury, Massachusetts, had an, had an audience of millions, maybe even billions of people around wow. the world. <laughs> so this is my long segue into one telling people to go see this Aqua Home show at the MFA, which is just beautiful. And you'll see her original Google Doodle in that exhibition. But how do we see, how do we see them surfacing with the Olympics here? Oh my goodness! They, they, Google has gone delightfully insane. Uh, they, oftentimes, oftentimes they'll celebrate something by actually giving you a game uh, as the Google Doodle. Like if, you, if there's like a little play icon, a little play button inside the the Google Doodle. Like if you go to Google.com, obviously it's that little graphic at the very very top of the page. If you're on a mobile device, sometimes it's the Google search box will be a special little character someplace in there. And you're used to these little ga- little mini games that okay, they're fun to play like for about a minute or two. And it actually takes a minute or two to play them. And after that, if you want to continue to do it, it's just playing the same game over and over again and just trying to get a higher score. But, oh, my God, they, they've done the Citizen Kane of Google Doodle games. <laughs> uh, really? To, for, to celebrate the Olympics for the entire duration of the Olympics through April uh, through August 8th, uh, the, you, the, the doodle is going to be the same. The Doodle Champion Island Games. Now, even now, I want to I want to point out that Google is a t- multiple trillion dollar company. They ro- they run a big part of the world. Even they are terrified of using the word Olympics for being sued by the by the International <laughs> Olympic Committee. So they're calling it the Doodle Champion Island Games. And to honor the traditions and the culture of Japan, they created this complete immersive. A commercial style uh, Japanese role playing game, which is a, a style of game that originated in Japan. It's this adorable, like 16 bit style uh, game in which you are lucky the calico cat who arrives on this on this island where every where they're having their annual like athletic championship. There are seven master champions on seven different events, so you explore the island to find where the event these events are happening play these mini games each one is a different game they've got like skateboarding archery rugby artistic swimming rock climbing <laughs> uh, a, a marathon and they're all completely unique and different games uh, and trying to beat the champion so that uh, and get all seven of these these little scrolls uh, and in the middle in the middle of it you can explore the island there are side quests like you might bump into someone saying oh my god i can't I, I can't find my kid help me find my kid there are like dozens of these little mini games you can find people and talk to them uh, it's, there's a full soundtrack involved in this. There are fully animated like cutscenes and and uh, and story scenes. Like that's, that's, you'll you'll like be talking to somebody or uh, or if you uh, you 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 win one of these competitions, the champion it turns into this fully hand drawn like cell animation anime of this this champion who rep- who is based on some part of uh, Japanese mythology and culture. This beautifully animated segment comes in rewarding you for having won this thing. I have been. I have not been very productive for the past week since this became active. <laughs> I'm only, and I'm only through half of it, and I'm determined to continue to play this until I finish this game. It is one of the funnest games I have ever encountered, ever. Not just in a doodle, uh, and I feel as though with my general ineptitude, ineptitude in gameplay. It is going to take me until uh, August 8th to finish it. Uh, but, but even if you don't, it, it will be still archived on google.com slash doodles, just like all the rest of them. Uh, and, and you don't have to do it all in one sitting. It will save your progress as you go through. Uh, and I, again, I, 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 if, I'm, if I was a little bit flustered at the very, very beginning, I was, quote, preparing for talking to you guys by saying, I should probably, <laughs> I should probably try to improve my score uh, on, the, on, the, on the skateboarding competition. And the, uh, 
you called me right in the middle of, oh, that's right, I was waiting for your call. <laughs> okay, gee, I shouldn't be doing that. Uh, okay. <laughs> so Andy, basically, it's, it's, it's the summer jam. It's the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the song of the summer for you, I think. So before you go, I wanted you to, to tell me, uh, I guess if I were the kind of person that knew how to disassemble uh, my laptop with one screwdriver, I'd be really excited about this next story about a new laptop that's uh, wonderfully repairable and upgradable. But I, I don't. I think a lot of people would would be clueless, but in, we got a little bit more than a minute left. Tell us why we should be excited about this uh, uh, oh, framework. This is this the framework is the name of this company. It's on frame dot works is, is the URL. They decided to create an entire computer company based on the premise that if you design a laptop from the ground up to be easy to repair, easy to disassemble, to make the parts easy to find and easy to replace that they can, A, make a lot of money, make a lot of people happy, uh, make a laptop that will last for years and years and years, and also basically upset the breakfast of Apple and all these other companies that say, no, no, it's impossible. We can't make, you can't make a, a laptop with normal screws that anybody can take apart and upgrade themselves. And they've basically proven by making this incredibly middle of the road, absolutely nothing unusual about it. It's stylish. It's compact. It's about the exact same size as, as a MacBook Pro, but you take a normal screwdriver, undo five screws, take out the back, and if you've spilled coffee into your keyboard, you can take out the keyboard, <laughs> buy a new one from the company, they will send you the new keyboard, uh, and fix it yourself for basically next to nothing, whereas Apple would tell you, oh, un un unfortunately, the keyboard is part of the upper case assembly that has the trackpad and all kinds of other things. It's going to cost you eight or $900 to replace what is essentially a $120 keyboard unit, uh, and it's it's uh, it's going to be a good choice for a lot of people uh, who would rather upgrade and be able to repair. But also, I love the fact that it simply exists as a counter argument to all of these companies that are fighting right to repair by saying, no, 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 a mod you can't make a modern laptop that has the performance uh, and the styles that everybody wants right now and still make it easy for people to up to fix their own RAM, to do all these things for to it themselves. Said, no, well, here you go. <laughs> for, for exactly the same amount of money as any other laptop, here's is a completely easy to easy to repair laptop. If you can if you can add oil to your car, you can fix most of this yourself. I swear. Uh, okay, I don't know about Andy. that. <laughs> Mar Marjorie and I are thinking not so much. <laughs> but thank, thank you for that. I'll, I'll help you. If you call, I'll help. Okay, you. okay. we'll drive down to Rhode Island, and you can get the screwdriver out. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Andy. I got one on me. <laughs> bye bye. Andy, Andy Inatko joins us regularly. He's a tech writer and blogger. You can find his work at inatko.com, and you can follow him at inatko, which, as we always say, is I H N A T K O. Coming up, the state of the arts. We continue our reopening series with the ICA's Jill Medvedal and a look at how museums adapted to a year of pandemic restrictions. Keep your dial on 89.7 GBH Boston Public Radio. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jared Bowen is in for Jim Browdy and joining us now to talk about what's going on on the art scene all around Boston, the state, what's going on at the ICA. Uh, we're going to be joined in just a second by Jill Medvedal. She's the Ellen Matilda Post Director of the Institute of Contemporary Art, and we are thrilled to have her with us. Thank you so much for joining us, Jill. I'm so happy to be here. I'm sorry that we're not together in person. I know. I well, speaking of not being together in person, yeah. I read this wonderfully joyous story in the Globe uh, from just about two months ago, May 28th, uh, talking about after 16 months bereft of facial expressions, the ICA's director is looking forward to seeing visitors' smiles again inside her museum galleries. And the story went on, as I said, quite joyously. Uh, talking about how things were going to get somewhat uh, back to some normalcy at, at uh, your museum and others. And now we're kind of up in the air with these latest CDC guidelines about wearing masks inside. So what's happening at the ICA, Jill? Well, I mean, joy is one of my favorite tropes. Uh, I seek it. I respect it. And I think it, you know, people and art in combination are a great recipe for joy. Uh, but it is a, we're, you know, we have gone backwards. I mean, what can I say? Uh, you know, according to the CDC, Boston 
is, uh, you know, Suffolk County is at substantial risk again with our numbers. And so we're back in constant conversation with the Museum of Fine Arts and the Gardner Museum. We, we see ourselves in many ways as one, one, one citywide museum. Dif- we're quite different, but uh, we do try to align in making sure that all of our visitors and our staff can kind of share some expectations when they, when they enter our doors. And we're looking at changing up our masking requirements yet again uh, to respond to the variant. It's, uh, it's not happy. Yeah. And so what about, uh, I get so dejected when I start to even think in, in this vein, but as you start to watch what's happening now, at least half of the population, or we're getting to the point where half of the population is vaccinated, hopefully more. Uh, do you foresee a moment where you might have to close again? Or, or do you think at this point you're able to keep the museum and museums, as you look at yourselves collectively, uh, open for the foreseeable future and hopefully forever from this point? I, I think we will be open. I think that we are all so lucky to live here in Massachusetts with our high vax rates um, and the c- constant shared information and data. Uh, so that, that does build a lot of confidence. I, I think that with masking and increasing vaccination rates and increased efforts to reach out and bring the vaccine wider and more knowledge, um, even though we don't love all the information we're getting, but you know, just more and more knowledge about both the virus and the vaccines, I think that we will stay open. And it's and enabling people, you know, welcoming people back into our museums. I mean, Jared, you were you were there recently, but I mean, I, I wish everyone would experience the joy uh, that was just manifest when we reopened with our kind of big, long delayed exhibitions at both the watershed in East Boston and, and at the ICA and Van Pier at the end of June. And people were just so happy to be back looking at art in real life, looking at one another, having a sense of collective experience of of beauty and being provoked, being challenged, being educated, being inspired. I think if anyone wondered whether museums matter, uh, we do. Let me ask about that. I remember you told me very early on, I think it was last summer when the museum did reopen, I think this was a combination of what you were thinking and the great Kelly Gifford at your museum was acknowledging too that it's a lot harder to open a museum than it is to close one. You had to give it a lot of thought. There was a lot of operational, there were a lot of operational challenges. Mm -hmm. But also on top of that, you were reopening in a world which had changed significantly since the time in which you'd closed, both because of the pandemic, because of the racial reconciliation, because society had changed so much. So what what guided you as you reopened? Well, we have had some practice now. Um, but I think that what, what guided me then and what guides me now, and and to be to be honest, what has long been, I think, uh, a guiding light and direction for me is understanding that the vibrancy of our museums really depends on our relevance and how we resonate with the broadest swath of people uh, who we want to welcome into our doors and building that relevance and resonance through exhibitions, through performances, through having ways to uh, see and experience art for free, whether it's outside at our Harbor Walk Sounds or our summer sessions on Friday nights or at the watershed, which is always free for all people all summer, or whether it's the kind of work we do and have done for years now with teenagers, with uh, after school programs. So that's consistent. What changed was, and what we had to change was to really interrogate ourselves about what did it mean to be a community resource during the time we've all been through for the last year and a half. And that led to more change. And in particular to using our watershed for food distribution in um, collaboration with our fantastic 
organizations with whom we partner in East Boston, learning from them, understanding that, uh, you know, sometimes the great, that it's better to be, you know, a strong follower as much as it is to be a strong leader. Uh, and that's true, I think, on the issues of racial justice and anti-racism too, to hear from staff, to hear from our colleagues in the city, um, and to understand that learning goes in many directions. We're talking to Jill uh, Medvedal. She's the director of the Institute of Contemporary Art. You know, you've mentioned the watershed a couple of times, and for those people who haven't been lucky enough to get out there, and it really is something, the boat ride is great, arriving is great, the whole thing is great. Describe what the watershed is. Okay, Uh, I love this question. (laughs) (laughs) The watershed, well, let me tell you what it was. The watershed was a condemned and decrepit uh, former copper pipe and sheet metal factory. And it's in the East Boston shipyard in Marina. So it was falling apart. Let's just say roof falling down, asbestos, not good. The ICA, we've been long looking for a way actually to accomplish two things that turned out to have one solution. How to make the 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 time spent longer for our visitors, how to offer more art. So there was just more value for people who are kind of making the effort to come to the museum. And two, how to connect more more concretely with East Boston, which as we look out over Boston Harbor from the ICA, we think of Boston Harbor as our front lawn, East Boston as our next door neighbor. And so we were, and we've been, you know, long, long committed to activating the waterfront and making sure it is accessible that to people from across the city, seeing it as a great common resource, not privatized, common. And so we were so lucky to work with generous people. We raised the money and invested in, um, in the watershed. Massport has been an incredible partner with us. Uh, but, and so we renovated it to be open seasonally, kind of typically Memorial Day to Labor Day-ish. And we run a six minute water taxi that's free to members and with the price of admission, or it's free to just be in East Boston by the T or walking or driving and you walk in and it's there for like a monumental work of art by an artist that deals with the scale of the place. It's got these huge ceilings and it's got garage-like doors that open on either end with the view of the harbor. Um, But that deals with both the history and the location of the seaport, of this maritime history, of the history of of kind of both people and products that were transported with Boston money and You know, so it's a fraught history as well as a history of dynamic immigration generation after generation in East Boston. It's like the history of transportation, like with the airport opening in the 30s and how that's changed. And and in the watershed, you still see train kind of the track that tram, you know, that they carried the materials and these gantries and columns, a local architectural firm on Mahin Winton did the renovation for us, and it's awesome. And we should mention that Fierle Baez, people can go online and see my piece on the, on my interview with her and how she created this this evocation of the Sans Souci Palace from Haiti emerging, thrusting up from the sea inside the watershed. But before we ask you, Jill, about uh, what people can see at the, the your original site too, the Virgil Abloh Show, let me just ask you a little bit about money. We've been asking arts leaders who've come on about uh, a lot of them in the f- performing arts realm about federal funding that has come their way or hasn't come their way because there's been a lot of a lot of this funding has been stalled. There's been conflict here. Where do you stand on what the federal government has done for you and museums at writ large? Well, the, uh, what we, the ICA, have been, were lucky enough to receive one PPP loan, um, and that was fantastic. That covered a couple of months of salary back in the early days of the pandemic. You know, we didn't lay off any staff. We kept our entire our entire staff employed throughout this whole difficult time. Um, and we have we have the great great museum team in 
in the world, I would say. Um, we have experienced some of what the stalledness you're describing, Jared, in that we've applied for a shuttered venues operators grant, and we are waiting with bated breath and, you know, fingers crossed, hoping we're going to hear sometime soon. Um, and that would have an incredibly positive impact. We don't see our earned revenue coming back this year. I think it'll take an, another full year for that to be regained, even despite the popularity of like the Virgil Abloh show. But, uh, you know, it it's had a quite devastating impact on all of us uh, writ large. Um, and, you know, what I want to see, you know, I want to see us get this money. I want to see all, my, all our colleagues get this money. But what I really want to see is somebody in sitting in the cabinet for arts and culture in the United States. Yeah. I want power and money. I want to see somebody in the domestic policy council. I mean, I want to see the arts and culture recognized for, uh, for the importance that it plays, whether it's in the job market, workforce training, civic pride, education of our young people in and out of school, inspiration. I mean, I, I could go on and on healing, which we've seen over and over again. So my aspirations are really bigger than these immediate relief grants. Should I ask if we've seen you on the shuttle to Washington? Have you had any <laughs> meetings at the White House, Jill Medvedal? No one's, no one's invited me. <laughs> Um, but I will say that, you know, you know that the ICA, I mean, I am over the moon about this, but the ICA was selected by the State Department um, to be the commissioner of the U.S. Pavilion at the next Venice Biennale, uh, which opens in April of 22. And we're um, organizing an exhibition of the great, great artist Simone Lee, uh, as well as working uh designing a partnership with Spelman College and doing teacher training and then bringing all that work back to Boston um, as part of a major survey exhibition. And so we are hoping to see our national leadership there uh, when, when we open April, depending on how the world is turning, uh, where we we're extending an invitation to our national leadership um, uh, Simone Lee will be the first black woman to represent the United States in Venice in the history of the pavilion, which opened in 1930. Um, so we think that we're about to make history again. And so who knows? Uh, maybe Washington, Boston and Venice can all. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Jill Mavidal, you mentioned, we've mentioned a couple of times this Virgil Abloh, um, uh, you're obviously in the wrong place show. Tell people, uh, describe it, because I'm looking at pictures, but of course we're on the radio, so people aren't seeing anything. Tell us about it. Well, it's called Figures of Speech, and it's a major exhibition. It was organized by the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, our great colleagues there. And it explores the art and all of the creativity of Virgil Abloh. And Virgil Abloh is many things. Um, he is an artist, he is a fashion designer. He's the artistic director of Louis Vuitton's menswear. He founded the brand Off-White. Off-White was recently, like two weeks ago, acquired by LVMH, making Virgil Abloh the most powerful black man in fashion. Wow. Uh, he is a path breaker. And what is and when you go to the ICA, you're going to see examples of his fashion, this incredible mural that actually charts almost as a timeline, all of his off-white fashions um, on the lower part of the mural. And the upper part of the mural are scenes uh, from Ghana, where his family is from. Uh, and it shows you how the influences, the whole show shows you the the different influences that merge in Virgil's work that come from the street, but also from across uh, the art world and art, the art historical world. So he is a polymath. He trained as an engineer. He has worked in architecture and design. He studies advertising and he really busts open. You know, I wish we were in person and 
not not only on the radio today, but you know the kind of conventional way art history has always been taught and presented is vertically. So you know your hands are on top of one another. But if you just shift it and make your hand you know out outstretch your arms so it's horizontal, you begin to see how how much how rich it is to turn that into a horizontal axis, not a vertical one. And that is what Virgil Abloh does. I mean, there's a gown he designed for Beyonce. There's his work as a DJ and with music, the work he's done on jewelry, the importance of hip hop and skateboarding, and how all of these are communities that have both fed and nourished him, um, but that are that he really brings into the exhibition space. Well, what I thought was fascinating is to uh, and i was uh, by your museum a uh, recent saturday morning and i saw this throng of people and then i realized they were there i, I think i never confirmed it but, but for the virgil abloh show or a talk or something and and mm-hmm. they, they they love the merchandise I, the way he resonates with young people is just fascinating and so heartwarming to understand especially when you hear the way that he has influenced people's lives as people you know he has talked about he was the only one he knew of. He is the only one, one of few people he knows of who are of color in the fashion industry. So what he represents to young people resonates deeply. Yeah, he talked about how, you know, what he was trying to do with this exhibition was to bring his inside outside. Because when he was growing up, he didn't see that represented on the walls of the museums in Chicago where he grew up. Um, And what's amazing is that his appeal is, uh, it really is broad and diverse. It is um, young people, it is people in the middle. Uh, It is black and white and brown. It is all over the map. Uh, It's really been exciting to see the ICA welcoming so many people who are there for the first time and who are having a fantastic experience and who I think will come back as they begin to see that over and over again, our program uh, just creates so many opportunities for them to see themselves, to see others, to walk in someone else's shoes, but to see their own shoes, no pun intended with Virgil, because he's got a lot of, you know, sneakers. (laughs) Um, But, you know, I think that is what we in the arts can do. Well, you know, for for people that haven't been to the ICA, again, the whole building is spectacular, and you're right on the water, and you've got, uh, I don't know if it's open now, but you have the outdoor deck where you can sit outside Mm -hmm. and have lunch, like right on the water. So in addition to all the artwork and the exhibits, Jill, it's just a fantastic place to go for a a, a day inside and outside. Yeah, I mean, mean, you're right, Marjorie. Tonight is, you know, Thursday nights are free at the museum, but it's also when we have Harbor Walk Sounds, which is term program we have with Berkeley. Um, I mean, how lucky are we? We just have the greatest partners, you know, across the city, you know, in almost every neighborhood now. And people can come, they can sit and hear music, look at our gorgeous view, have this beautiful breeze in the summer. Uh, it's, it's, It's spectacular and it's there for others. It's there to share. That's the power of it. Well, Jill Medvedal, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It was great to talk to you, Jill. Appreciate your time. Okay, I miss you both. Hope I see you in person soon. Me too. I'll see you in Venice. (laughs) Okay, for sure. (laughs) Bye. Bye. We're going to make that work, Marjorie. (laughs) Yeah, Venice. Okay, I'm there. Jill Medvedal is the Ellen Matilda Post Director of the Institute of Contemporary Art. Coming up, what if there were such a thing as free lunch? Would that get you to back into the workplace? We're taking your calls, asking what your employer needs to do to lure you into the office. That conversation is next on 89.7 GBH Boston Public Radio. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jared Bowen is in for Jim Browdy. So recent polling finds that most people want to continue working from home, and as employers try to lure workers back into the office, the Delta variant is only complicating workplace reentry. One business says it knows how to get people off the couch and into the cubicle. 
free lunch. That's the ad campaign Easy Cater is using, running commercials that promote free food as the best way to lure people back into work. And who could disagree with free food being a lure to get back to the office? Anyway, you're taking your calls, asking, would that work for you? Would free food have you reconsidering your remote work situation? Or do you need a lot more than that? Maybe you need free parking. I think that would make the people that are advocating for everybody to get back in the tea upset. But a lot of people, I think, would be lured by free parking, especially if you work downtown. But what are the things you'd like to see back at your office that would make you feel better about having to give up your, you know, expand waist pants and your elastic <laughs> waistbands and get up and put your, get your hair fixed and put your shoes on and go out to the office? Our number is 877-301-8970. 877-301-8970. The email is bpr at wgbh.org, and you can tweet us at Boss Public Radio. Okay, Jared, what do you think about free food? That That is a big lure, is it not? Free food is a – yeah, that's that's huge. <laughs> I mean, Although, think about the time you spend every day getting your – packing your lunch. You're very neat. You ha- Don't you use <laughs> the Tupperware things? Jim usually has seven, like, Tupperware things with does. little yeah. things of little things of broccoli and little things of And they of are fruit. little things. They're all these little tiny containers. That's right. It's like a pile of eight <laughs> or ten containers. I mean, it takes them an hour and a half to get ready every day. And you have your little containers, too, I've noticed. I do. I do. Not quite as many as he does. I usually have one container and a sandwich, but he's got the whole thing going. And um, it's, it's very time-consuming. And a lot of companies now, I, I know one of my kids worked for a company that had breakfast and lunch, and twice a week they had dinner. Now what? the problem, the problem, well, the problem is that, that you wouldn't be leaving the office. Is it's a lure to keep you there all day and into the evening, but it is awfully nice not to have to pay for food, go out and lunch, go out to lunch and buy food, or if you are cheapskates like Jim and I, and 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 you are too, Jared, you're bringing your own, you're brown bagging it, right? Well, that's because you can create a healthy lunch. Oh, you can create a healthy lunch. And I'm lunch. a cheapskate. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. You can create a healthy, and that's my fear of free food, by the way, is that I would be distracted, and the next thing I know, I would have been overeating for <laughs> quite yeah. some, some months. And I tell you, I hate to say this because I'm I'm uh, so worried about the climate and driving around is not helping anybody. Free parking is a big, huge deal, right? If you have free parking, I remember in places like the, the Boston Globe where I worked for a little bit and the Boston Herald where I worked for most of my career had free parking, Jared, and then they moved the offices Ooh, and talk yeah. about a revolution among the employees. People were hysterical. We're going to have to pay to park. I can only imagine how much the people had to pay to park downtown at the Globe because it's down there on State Street. Imagine that. What's that? What's State Street? Like 45 bucks a day? I think at least. I think you pay them to work. I think that's how that's how it goes. That happened to us at GBH, actually. We had free parking, and then our building moved. But we're only in Brighton, as you know. Yeah. So uh, it wasn't that far. I think free massages would be good. Massages? Would, that would get me to come back. Other than mandated vaccines, mm-hmm. uh huh. That <laughs> free massages uh, would get me to come back to work. Yeah, I think the mandated vaccines are going to be coming to a lot of places because if, if, if we continue the, the way we're going. You know what they have in some of these swank places they have they have meditation rooms like the googles and the facebooks with those swank california campuses i mean they have everything there right they have the the dry cleaners yeah, the dry that's center. huge dry cleaning is huge that would get me to come back to work well we have one right across the street jared you know that <laughs> our satellite <laughs> office i do i do i look out the window and see is it busy is the line down so i can run across the street and drop my clothing so what do you think? What would get you um, back to the office and make you feel better about leaving your little, your little cocoon back in your home office? Let's start with Whitney from Quincy. Thank you for calling. Hello, Jared. Hello, Marjorie. How are you? What have you Excellent. done with Jim? Put him in the trash? <laughs> <laughs> He'll be back on Monday. He's organizing and washing his containers. <laughs> That's <today>. right. <laughs> That's right. Doing, doing his laundry. Yeah. All right. Many years ago, I worked for a company in downtown Boston, and they lured us to work late at night by feeding us. And it worked for all of us. And they lured us into not taking lunch by feeding us, and it worked for all of us. That was in the days when everyone had a lot of money. Yeah. Today, with COVID and now Delta variant and having worked from home, aside from wanting to burn my couch, um, <laughs> I like... Working from home and going into the office as I need to. I don't know how I'm going to feel about going into the office every day. Is your is your company going to do every day or are they going to do the hybrid, do you, or do you not know yet? Well, they've had switched 
prior to Delta variant, they had switched to every day as of August 1st in the Georgia office. So I think it's only a matter of time in Massachusetts. We don't have an office yet. It's due to open in October. We were closed with COVID. Yeah. Well, Whitney, thank you for the call. I'm sorry if, uh, for your for your feelings towards your couch. <laughs> you know, you, you, you can swap out the couch. You don't have to burn it. That's just That's a little, right. a little bit could, of design advice. You could swap out. <laughs> a lot of people are talking about a, a better commute. That is a big deal to people that, that, that they are really upset about having to go back to these very, very long commutes. Coming down 93 in rush hour in the morning toward Boston when you're in Somerville, it's just back to back coming up 24, coming up the Southeast Expressway. I mean, think about how how much of your life you spent stuck in traffic, Jared? And I just heard the other day that one of the routes that they monitor is now actually longer than it was. It takes longer on that route than it uh, did in pre-pandemic levels. I well, guess. I think people are not taking the T or they're not taking the That's commuter right. rail. They're still right. nervous about it. So they're driving to work even with those extraordinary prices. 877-301-8970. Would free food lure you back to the office? Layla and Denham, thank you for calling. Hi. Uh, hi, Hi, Terry. Hi, Mary. Hi. Uh, so, hi. Yeah, so my workplace always has free food. So I work in uh, downtown Boston yeah. uh, in finance. And they always had it. And they, I mean, it's great. Like, it's always been pretty fancy. I really appreciate that. Like what? Uh, like what, Layla? Long- I know. We're what'd already you get? jealous. Yeah, what'd you get? Give us the menu. <laughs> so, they, so they order, like, takeouts uh, from area around Prudential or even, like, downtown Boston. Like, oh, um, right, yeah. Sam Lagras. Lagras? Oh. Sorry, the sandwich place. Yeah. yeah. And like love our sushi, things like that. It's really good. Wow. Yeah. So uh, anyways, uh, so after work from home for one year, I, I, I cook for myself. I realized it's, it's, it's not that bad to cook every day or not like just, uh, several times a week. And they asked us to go back and they were like, oh, we got food like um, wrapped think, uh, separately. So it, there's no like... Um, Safe issues like that, mm-hmm. and and I realize it's really not that much big deal how have food for free food. And right now, like I'm really looking, I'm really hoping that companies can compensate on commuting on the time and how much we put yeah. pay for yeah. the team. So yeah. I take on commuter real and I I do a calculation. So I so so first of all, like the first week I'm going back, I I ran into all kinds of hustle. Like I missed the train. Uh, I, I had to park in downtown Boston for like 40 bucks a day. And yeah, it's just like so much pressure on my yeah. mental health. Yeah. And right now, like every day, it costs me $8 per ride. So each day is like $16. So a wow. year is like, yeah, it's like at least $2,000. And I do want to be compensated for that. And not to mention my time spent on the train. Layla, thank you for the call. That's really that's that's expensive. That's, that's expensive. She's calling from Denham, so it's not like she's that far away either. That's a lot of money. I mean, the parking in Boston is so ridiculous. The parking in Boston is more than New York City in some places I've been to. You'd think we'd be cheaper, but we're not necessarily cheaper. Oh, definitely. Isn't it fascinating to go to another city and you park and it's only about two or three dollars an hour, and you think what? <laughs> I just paid one hundred and twenty dollars the last time I was downtown an hour. Yeah, I know, I know. A lot of places do that, though. They, they have they'll they'll order out, but some places have actual sandwiches right there. They have fruit right there. They've got bananas. They've got oranges. They've got you know sodas in the refrigerator. They've got pool tables. I mean, if you've been to some of these like these some of these places like Indeed that are these really nice companies. That- uh, no, I've only seen them in the movies. <laughs> Like when Topher Grace is playing against Robert De Niro on the, you know, they never work. They just play ping pong all day. Yeah. And well, just grab a martini from yeah. the nearby bar and at, but it in does, the office. It does save you not just money, but it saves you enormous amounts of time, it seems to me. Elise from Cambridge, thank you for calling. Hi. So a long time ago when my brother was working in like a very fancy law firm in New York City, they had this thing where if you worked a certain number of hours, I don't know what it was, like 10 or 12 hours a day, they would then give you a gift certificate or a coupon to get takeout. So what he would do is then just like work those hours, work really hard, then go get takeout and go sit at home in the luxury of his own condo (laughs) or whatever and eat. And I yeah. thought that was a great idea. Yeah, that's not bad. That's a brilliant idea. Yeah, that's not bad. 
some of these places, these, uh, these, these Wall Street firms, I don't know if they still do it now, but they used to have, not only did they have like chefs ordering you lunch, but they had bars. So at the end of the trading day, you'd step off the trading floor or the euro dollar broker floor, whatever you were doing, and go in and have, you know, order your dinner and have a cocktail. Imagine that's, that. That's not What would you say, Elise? Firm, what huh? they did at his firm was they had a whole closet of Pepperidge Farm cookies. <laughs> Which there you go. Win. There you go. It, that's not, you know, I, it, well, I kind of like that in a way, though. I remember being at the Herald, going to the vending machine. You get hungry about 6 o'clock before you're getting hungry. You haven't had time. You go to your dinner, and you, you put the money in the vending machine. You get, go through the trouble of getting all the quarters, you know, to put in the vending machine. And then, of course, they get stuck, right? You know, you'd hear every day the people be banging on the vending <laughs> machine, trying to get their, their Hershey's kisses to come down on the vending machine or stuff like that. I would feel better about my workplace, I think, if, if, there, were, um, if there were food close by. Well, we had – I have two thoughts. One, I remember we had identified in our old building the, the, the soda machine that would give you two Cokes. And so <laughs> we went there quite a bit until they figured it out why all the Cokes were missing. And then I just remembered uh, with the last call too, when I first started out, I was working at, um, at Dateline in New York for NBC at 30 Rock. And if you work late enough, then you could get a car service home. Oh, I like that. Because you were in New York City. So they didn't want you walking around super late at night. So, of course, a lot of us would just work, work, work. And then take the car service home. That's not bad. Nice. Yeah, that's a nice little perk, too. John says, skipping the daily commute is worth more than the company giving me a daily lobster roll. So I guess he's, <laughs> he's sick of the traffic. Jody says, more money to get me back to the office. A lot of our listeners are less interested in food than they are in getting, uh, getting some extra perks um, to, be, uh, to be back in their, in their desk. Chloe in Watertown, what do you think? Hi, Chloe. Um, well, hi. Hi. Love you guys both. Um, <laughs> so I've had to go into the office twice a week through the whole duration of the pandemic. And during the course of the pandemic, my company moved from Kendall Square to outside of Boston. The new office has tons of great amenities. Like it has a cafe that has really cheap lunch and really nice people. And it has a free gym that we can use and covered parking wow. that's free. And that's fantastic. The one thing that would keep me going into the office is knowing which coworkers they're going to require to come back into the office. What do you mean? You, you mean you only want to work with Meaning. certain people that you want to get rid of the ones you can't stand? <laughs> is that like what you're talking about? Like you're, you're picking your team? <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe some people can stay working remotely and we don't, you know, have to have the awkward chit chat at the water cooler. Um, yeah. But some, you know what I mean? Just like, who's coming back in? <laughs> well, don't you find, I don't Chloe, I, I, it's, it seems to me it's really true, especially if you're in a big open office where everybody's got a desk and they're all, you're all kind of together, there's no separations. You do spend an awful lot of time just just wasting your time chatting up your, your coworkers. I mean, you know, you'd be standing there leaning over each other's desks and then finally one of the bosses would say, get back to work or something like that. I mean, when you're home working by yourself or just with your spouse or your, your dog or whatever – you're not wasting a bunch of time chatting up your coworkers, yeah, right? Because Judge Judy does not answer back when you're talking to her <laughs> in the That's middle exactly. of the afternoon. That's exactly right. Hey, Chloe, thank you very much for the call. I think it would help to hey, – Chloe's got a good point. You want to handpick the people that are going to be there the day yeah, you're there. Yeah, you yeah, know? This is back to – this is like high school and dodgeball. You can't pick your team <laughs> at work. You can't decide who well, comes in. You know, there are certain people you like to chat with and certain people you don't like to chat to with and certain people you, you dread when they're coming toward your desk and certain people you're excited to see them. I think that would make a big difference too. Katie from Chelmsford, what do you think? Hi. Um, so I was thinking that the thing that I've really enjoyed about being – home during COVID is that I've been able to like go out and take walks in the middle of the day and walk my dog and make lunch in my own kitchen. So I feel like I I don't think this is going to work for me, but if there was a way to come and do half days or come in for the meetings or the things that feel like are more helpful to be in person and go home for the rest of the day, that would be a lot more appealing to me than free lunch or whatever else. So Katie, what's your company going to do? Do you know? So I actually um, adjunct instruct um, at colleges. And so this will be interesting because I'm upset that the timing I'm teaching is during the time when I would normally do those things like walk the dogs uh, and make lunch. Yeah. But I think that that is really the best model. 
Yeah, well, teaching, though, I think you would agree, is a lot easier in person. I mean... So that's the, uh, the plus side is yeah. to be able to be there to actually do the teaching. Yeah, yeah. Katie, thank you for the call. I think te- I think that's one of the things we've learned from this pandemic, that these poor teachers, they got kids on Zoom, they got kids in the classroom, they got to have the kids separated. They may, again, be in mass in the fall. I think teachers have had a really tough tough time this year. Yeah. I think it's going to be very, very exhausting. So, Jared, if you were going to have the free food um, menu at the at GBH, uh, would you, anything particularly you'd like to like to have there? Lobster rolls and <laughs> fries for days. <laughs> That's what I would want. Truffle fries, Jared. I'm into the truffle Ooh, fries truffle, now. Parmesan? Yeah. Yeah, they're, oh, they're they're really the best. It's my new obsession, the truffle fries. Okay, for people that are wondering, Jim is going to be back on Monday, but we we have had a lot of fun here, Jared, you and I, have we not? Wait, are people wondering? Uh, when, well, when, are, when are you getting rid of Jared? When, when, no, when did you hear the person? Back? Did you hear the person that um, called? And someone just mentioned that a few minutes ago. Yeah, no, I'm just. And kidding. I said they'd be back. They'd be back on Monday. No, actually, I haven't gotten any calls <laughs> or emails. <laughs> <laughs> Hope not. Hope Jim is not listening. He's no emails. Disguising his voice. You're going okay. to get back. So I want to say tomorrow we're going to have Dr. Catherine Gergen Barnett. She's going to be with us for an hour taking our questions and yours on all things coronavirus. What does it mean uh, that we may have to be vaccinate, I mean, masking up all over again, the impact of the uh, unvaccinated on those who are fully vaccinated? Uh, that's going to be a great show. We're so grateful she's going to come in with us. We want to thank our crew, Chelsea Murs, Zoe Matthews, Aiden Conley, Mackenzie Farkas. Our engineer is John the Claw Parker. Miles Smith and Dave Goldstein run our remote studios. You know, I know it's Thursday and not Friday, but you get a show coming up tomorrow night too. Want to tell us what you're doing? Well, a little bit, a little while ago, we were talking about the Google Doodle by way of the artist Aqua Holmes, who has a really wonderful, vibrant, colorful show of her work at the Museum of Fine Arts. She was somebody who. We had a little exhibition at J.P. Licks. I should mention she's been an artist her entire life, but had a little tiny exhibition at the ice cream store at J.P. Licks that turned into a series of book deals where she does the illustrations. So you'll be able to see those original illustrations, but they're very layered, very deep. She's often pick, depicting uh, the black experience, and I say layered because she weaves in headlines and it demands slow looking. So we'll take you through that, we'll, and I, you'll see my interview with her in her studio. And then also the great actor Gabriel. Real burn, you might remember. Oh him from my gosh! The stage yes. and in treatment, uh, he gets very introspective. Speaking of playing a psychotherapist in, in treatment, he gets very introspective for a new memoir that he has out called "Walking think, with Ghosts." Do you think if we watch in treatment, it will, prefu- it will help our lives? Should we watch it? We can only try and hope, <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, Jared. Thanks a lot for uh, filling in. I much appreciate it. I'm Marjorie Egan. I'm Jared Bowen. Thanks again for tuning in. I hope you can tune in tomorrow and have a great day.